Good morning, everyone. I'm going to assume you can hear me. Yes, we can, Wendy. All good. Good morning. Good morning. So my name is Wendy Baker. I'm here with Bob Nixon. We're commissioners appointed to hear the resource consent application by McLaughlin Safari for a two-lot subdivision and a um, identification of a building platform and also a section 127 variation of conditions to um, remove a covenant condition. Um, obviously we're all familiar with this zooming now so if everyone can just make sure they keep their microphone muted when they are not speaking so we don't get too much interference um then hopefully this will be reasonably painless um i apologize to anybody who was ready at nine o'clock this morning i had um understood it was 10 o'clock so it is on me that we are starting an hour later um, we will um, probably take a break at 12. We might take a very short comfort break in between. Otherwise, we will carry straight on through to 12. So are there any... I might just call for appearances. Who do we have here? Thank you, Commissioner Baker and Nixon. Ms Hockley, I appear for the applicant. Um, now, my team is in the Lane Leaf boardroom and also Mr Scalpin. So in the Lane Leaf boardroom we have Ms Turner, my co-counsel, and Mr Freeman, planner, and who will introduce themselves. Sorry, so you've got co-counsel Mr Skelton and Mr Freeman, is that correct? Uh, no, co-counsel Ms Turner, who's yes. in the Lane Neve boardroom, yes. uh, along with Mr Freeman, who's also in the Lane Neve boardroom, and then we have Mr Skelton, who is um, on a separate Zoom call. Okay. Who else is present? I'm just wondering who the council officers are. Sorry. <laughs> Good morning, Commissioner. Sorry, um, I'll just jump in. Um, Mr. Hearn for council, and we've got Mr. Woodford here and Mr. Beattie. Sorry, say that again. Uh, it's myself, Mr. Hearn, Mr. Woodford, and Mr. Denny. I know. Right. And then um, I see we have Mr. Eaton, submitter. Yeah. Can you hear yeah. me? Um, is that it? I think Mr. Eaton is the only submitter Wanting presenting to today. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. Okay. We are there any preliminary matters, Miss Hockley? No, Commissioner. There are none. Okay. Right, well, we are then in your hands. Now, I would like you to present your submissions, please, as I have not read them in great detail. Yes, certainly. Now, just before I kick off, in, in a meeting this morning, I did drop off briefly um, for a couple of seconds. So if, if that happens again, please let me know and I can repeat whatever it was that I was saying. Certainly. Um, before I commence the case for the applicant, uh, there have been a couple of um, developments in the Environment Court in terms of Chapter 24 of the PDP. So would it might be useful if I take you through those court decisions first, um, which are appended to my legal submissions, and then I'll kick off into our case. Uh, yes, so certainly we'll, I think we'd appreciate that because um, I, I understand the decision came out on the 12th of April. Mm -hmm. I didn't become aware of this until about 36 hours ago. And uh, the first time I've actually seen the interim decision is this morning. So yeah. I've been reading through frantically as far as I could get to. I think I've got page 36 or thereabouts. So we've got a, a uh, bit of a moving feast here and we're, we're completely uh, blindsided to some extent. So yes. some explanation would be helpful, please. Yes, absolutely. Um, that won't be a problem. If I can start at Appendix 3 of my legal submissions, um, 
So this appendix contains a case note that I have prepared on the decision, and it also contains the decision itself. Appendix three, the Barnhill Corporate Trustee. Yes, that's correct. So as I said, I prepared a case note here um, which addresses the interim decisions of the court in the Barnhill decision, which as you've said was released on the 12th of April. Um, and what this case note does is it outlines the changes that the court has um, directed to be made to chapters 3, 24 and 27 of the PDP. Um, it also sets out the reasons for those changes and the legal effect. Um, and finally, I've appended um, my interpret or I've appended marked up provisions um, that represent my interpretation of what that decision is. Uh, importantly, some of the changes made by the court in this interim decision are final, while others are provisional. And the provisional changes, the court has provided the opportunity for the council and parties um, to provide submissions on final drafting. I'll, uh, I'll take you through and make clear which of those changes are final and which are provisional as I go through. At a high level, what the interim decision has done is moved away from the two-tier policy framework in the PDP. So chapter 24 as currently stands, has a two-tier framework, uh, including the precinct and the Wakatifu Basin Rural Amenity Zone. And the precinct, um, within the precinct, rural living is anticipated and there's bespoke policies and rules um, providing for that to take place. And outside the precinct, there's this 80 hectare minimum lot size standard um, and a default non-complying. What the interim decision does is changes the approach to a four-tier framework. So we still have the precinct, but then within the Wakatifu Rural Amenity Zone, the court develops three tiers, uh, a tier for very low, low, moderate, low, a second tier for moderate, and a, second, a third tier for moderate, high, or high, and provides different objectives and policies and rules for each of those three tiers. Uh, what's relevant to this application is uh, the first tier within the Wakatifu Basin Rural Amenity Zone, which relates to a, a low um, capability to absorb change, because that's what the LCUs are that we're dealing with today. Um, over the page, paragraph six, in terms of the low capability areas, the major implication of the interim decision is a change to policy 24.2.1.1. Now, this is a policy under the PDP that um, states require an 80 hectare minimum lot size, and the court has directed a provisional amendment to that policy that removes that requirement and instead focuses on um, maintaining and enhancing the landscape character and visual amenity of the relevant LCUs. And I'll, I'll take you through that change shortly. Um, but my submission is that this is the key change um, that's relevant to your decision today. Um, at paragraph seven and eight, I just simply detail uh, other changes that the court's directing to the Wakatipu Basin Rural Amenity Zone. Uh, however, those are not as relevant to you for your decision. Um, before I get on to taking you through the specific changes, I just wanted to address the relevance of this decision to you today. As I said before, some changes have been directed by the court as being final. Those changes now form part of the PDP. However, the changes that have been noted as provisional, which includes the change to policy 24.2.1.1, do not currently form part of the PDP. Um, and this is because there's potential for further uh, drafting refinements to be made to those policies. Uh, however, it's my submission that the provisional policies can be considered by you today as a relevant matter under 1041C of the RMA. And given the fact that the court's interim decision gives a clear direction that the policy framework 
is to change, I submit that the interim decision should be given considerable weight when considering the resource consent decision that you have to make. If I move on, pages three to 14 of the case note uh, set out in some detail the changes that are directed by the court and the reasons for those changes, um, which may assist you when considering the decision. I don't intend to take you through those now, but they are there for you um, if they are helpful uh, when you're considering this decision. When you're referring to those, this is the interim decision, paragraphs three to 14, is that what you're talking about? Uh, I'm talking about page page three to fourteen of my case notes. So there's a table oh, there, okay. Sorry, yeah. um, right. where I've set oh, out right. the details oh, of right. changes. Yeah. And after page fourteen, I have appended marked up provisions, which are my interpretation of the interim decision. And so you'll see there the first um, page of the market provisions is strategic chapter direct, strategic direction three. Yeah, and I understand they've added a new, provide a better linkage between chapter three and chapter 24. They're at, the court has added, the, we're proposing to add a new policy. 3258 or something like that? Yeah, yeah, that, that's correct. Um, before we go there, I'll just note that I've provided a key which shows the final decision text in red, underline and strike through, and anything provisional I've noted in grey um, background or in a comment box. So yes, now in, in terms of the, the key change for you today, I just wanted to take you to policy 24.2.1.1, which is shown in the marked up provisions. Can you see a blue comment box there against that policy? Okay, so yes. what we've got, yes, so we've got in the 24.2.1, looks like that's a proposed new objective, and beneath that, 24.2.1.1 shown with blue text, uh, or blue, blue underlining, or a blue background, and below that is the 24.2.1.1XX and the 24.2.1.1A. Yes, yes, that's right. So you're in the right spot. Um, and my submission is that the, the key change for you today, which relates to a low capability LCU, uh, is this change in BOO to 24.2.1.1. And, and you'll see there that what the court has directed is that the policy requiring an 80 hectare minimum be removed and amended um, to the text which is in the comment box. And the focus of the new provisional policy is on ensuring the achievement of objective 24.2.1, which is to maintain and enhance landscape character and visual amenity, and to ensure that the landscape character and visual amenity values of landscape character units are maintained. So where in the decision is that? Have you marked that? Which paragraph you've pulled that from? Uh, yes, I can tell you that in one moment. The reasoning of the court for that change is at paragraph 65 to 79. That's of the course decision. Yes, that's right. Interim decision, I should call it. Yeah, just a little unclear here because on that page of your notes, 
You've got the old 24211, I'll call it the old one, which is a bit of blue background. You've got to write a box out to the right, 24211, and then below it, you've got to grow a grey box. Yes, between yes. those. Yeah, and I'll, I'll clarify that. So any new policy is in a grey box. Yep. So those grey boxes are brand new policies. Yep. But where a policy isn't new, but instead is amended, I've put a comment box in. Oh, okay. Yeah. So in terms of how we need to look at this amended policy, um, at this stage, no decisions have been made on rules for minimum lot size. That's correct, isn't it? Decisions have been made on, um, for the purposes of your decision, the decision has been made on the rule for minimum lot size, and that's to stay at 80 hectares. So you have an 80 hectare rule trigger for a non-complying activity. Okay. But that then directs you to look at the objectives and policies of the plan, and it's this new, new policy that you're directed to look at. Okay. Okay. So, and then I'm looking at paragraphs, um, for example, paragraph 72, where the court has set out that those areas identified to have very low, low or moderate low landscape capacity collectively comprise the basin's character defining open working rural environment. So, mm -hmm. What the court is saying is we're looking for a, this is an open working rural environment. Is that is that a jump? Am I making a leap of faith then? And they were they went to the top of the Crown Range and confirmed that. Uh, so I, 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 it's all about an open working rural environment, it appears to me. Broadly, I would say that that's a broad statement from the court in terms of these LCUs as a whole. However, the court recognises that within each LCU, there are different sites and different um, environments um, that need to be considered, which takes me to the next decision of the Environment Court, which has also come out uh, very recently that I wanted to address you on. And that's at appendix two of my legal submissions. And it's a consent order that's recently been issued by the court. So this consent order was issued on 14 April. Appendix two. Um, was that topic 31, was it? Was that the one about the LCUs themselves and what they, because the court in their earlier decision were talking about, um, you know, what, what the wording of the LCUs themselves said, because I think there were some appeals on that. Is that what this relates to? So, yes, that's yeah. correct. This is one of those decisions. However, other decisions are, are still yet to come in terms of defining the exact text of the LCUs. But what this consent order does is amend the text of LCU 11. And so this consent order, we weren't aware of this consent order um, at the time of the applicant filing its evidence. So Mr. Freeman and Mr. Skelton's evidence don't address this change, but there some they'll provide you with a summary of their views on the change when they present their evidence. Um, but essentially what the Environment Court has done here has changed the description of LCU 11 and in particular with a relevant focus on the fact that parts of that LCU have a greater capacity to absorb development than other parts. Now, the, this, these changes are final, which means that this LCU description contained in this consent order do form part of the PDP for your consideration of this application, 
the text hasn't been included in the, the PDP document yet, um, but you can take this consent order as forming part of the PDP. Yeah, it's consent order, so that's a final yeah. state of step. I get it. So as far as LGU 11 is concerned, we've got a, fine, a finality, if I can use that word. That's what we have regard to, nothing else in respect to LCU 11. Now, that, that's also a, a good question. I understand that there is some uncertainty as to whether further changes will be made to this description through other appeals. This is simply one appeal. Um, but in terms of your consideration of the PDP, it, it, this is the document that you currently consider. But with the awareness that there are still appeals out there on the text. That's quite an important point for us, obviously, in terms of waiting. So you probably need to give us a bit more detail on that. And yes, I will. Um, if I can come to that a, a bit later when I come to my waiting submissions um, sure. as, a, as a whole, if, if that's all right with you, Commissioner. Yeah. Um, but if I wrap back to your question earlier, as to whether the court considers um, all aspects of the low capability LCUs um, as having the sort of broader open character, my answer is that it, it's clear from this consent order decision that it recognizes that there are part, parts of these LCUs or site specific areas that have more capacity to absorb development than others. Sorry, on what basis do you say that? Because I still see a capacity of low in LCU 11. On the text of the descriptions, um, <clears throat> where it's talking about <clears throat> uh, for instance, visibility and provenance, uh, localised landforms, vegetation patterns provide visual containment in places. Aspects of the LCU being reasonably discreet. Um, Mr. Skelton will provide uh, further evidence on this point. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, under visibility prominence, and New wording says localized landform, for example, benches and terraces and all vegetation patterns provide visual containment in places. It's almost tailor-made for your client's situation. I'm not saying deliberately, but that's effectively no, what no. it does. Yes, we would submit that that's the case, Commissioner. And Commissioner Baker, I, in my legal submissions, I will take you to a case, the Guthrie case, which is a high court case, which discusses how these LCU descriptions are to be dealt with. And in particular, the high court directs that all aspects of the LCU description uh, must be considered and that a, a description that it has a low capability is not an overriding consideration in the context of the full LCU description. And, and secondly, the court acknowledges that specific sites um, have to be considered on their merits. And that in some instances, there will be sites within a low capability LCU that um, can absorb greater development. And I'll take you to that when I present my legal submissions. Yeah, that will be very helpful. Uh, are there any the questions on these decisions before I um, move to my written submissions? I think one question that I have, which is probably a more general legal question for you, is this is an interim decision. Yes. It's not a consent order, or at least the, the first one you presented is. Um, so that can potentially be appealed. I'm not sure if we're outside the appeal period, but as it's an interim decision, do we wait for a final decision before appeal rights start and end? No, generally, so long as an interim decision um, makes a 
substantive finding, the appeal right commence at the time that the decision is made. I would, I would have to go back and reflect on what the dates of that appeal period are. Um, but generally, uh, unless of these specific circumstances, the appeal rights commence at the time decision is made. And at 15 working days, well, it's a high court, isn't it? Mm. Yes, yeah, I'll have to double check that. Yes, I don't think there are necessarily time frames on it. Okay, but we haven't had any appeals on this interim decision, is that your understanding? Yes, that's my understanding. And you've uh, suggested we put, should put significant weight. You referred to 1041C, but um, it, would it be fair to say that it would be an extraordinary state of affairs if, for example, the amendments proposed to 24.21, the objective, 24.211, the policy, were subsequently to change significantly in terms of their intent? Um, would almost bring the whole system to disrepute. So one imagines it's not going to change radically. Yes, I would agree with that. What the court has directed is drafting refinements. Um, the court's made a clear decision on what the intent of this new policy is going to be and what the policy direction is going to be. Um, it's simply uh, specific wording that the court has left open for further submission. Um, I presume you may cover this later, but with respect, with respect to the ODP and the waiting issue, should, given how far down the track we now are, I would assume that absolutely minimal weight would be given to the ODP. Yes, um, and, and given you've, uh, both commissioners, you've asked this waiting question now, perhaps it would be helpful if I address you on that point before commencing the case, um, and I do address that at paragraph 78 of my submissions. Sorry, page 78 of submissions. I was just pondering the things you were saying. Um, Right. Yeah, we, you probably understand we feel like we've just been hit by a tidal wave, but we're... Yes, it's, yes. yes. Um, uh, Ms. Hockley, are you, if you are finished presenting that additional um, event or information that you wanted to present to us, maybe just start at the start of your submissions rather than just jumping around. Quite yes, so certainly. Yeah. I think that would be more helpful. I think so, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, noting I will come to this waiting question. Thank you. Thank you. So, starting at the beginning, the shot of a trust seeks resource consent to undertake a subdivision to establish a two two residential lots at three six two Lyle Shot of a Road. Consent is also sought to identify one new residential building platform and associated access landscaping and earthworks. Evidence in support of the proposal has been filed in advance of the hearing by Mr. Freeman and Mr. Skelton. And these witnesses will highlight the key parts of their evidence and answer any questions that you have. In terms of the key issues before you, it's my submission that the site has unique physical and locational attributes that will enable the proposal to result in no more than minor adverse effects on landscape character and visual amenity. There will be no more than minor adverse localised cumulative and rural amenity effects, including on the adjoining property at 324 Lower Shotover Road. And the proposal is consistent with the objectives and policies of the ODP and the PDP. While the proposal does not achieve an 80 hectare minimum site area, it maintains the landscape character and visual amenity values of LCU 8 and 11 and the wider Wakatipu Basin is envisaged by objective 24.2.1. The proposal is consistent with objectives and policies of the PDP when considered as a whole, and also in the context of the recent interim decision by Barnhill. I submit it's appropriate to grant consent to the proposal. Now, over the page, I address the principles 
um, of addressing the receiving environment. Now, unless you'd like me to, I won't read that paragraph. However, I simply restate the principles from the Hawthorne case. That paragraphs. Yeah. Paragraph seven, the site is located on the eastern side of the lower shot over road. It is zoned rural general under the operative plan and Wakatipu Basin rural amenity under the proposed plan. Both Mr. Skelton and Mr. Denny agree that the site is appropriately classified as a VAL under the operative plan. And under the proposed plan, the site is identified as being located within LCU 11, the Slope Hill foothills. And a small area on the north of the site is located in LCU 8, Speargrass Flat. Now there's no built development proposed in LCU 8. The proposed building platform is entirely contained within the part of the site that is in LCU 11. It's my submission that the site is unique in the receiving environment, given that it is characterized by significant topographical differences and mature vegetation that are atypical of the general landscape character present in the wider LCU. The site is visually contained by existing vegetation and landform rather than being with an open rolling pastoral context that is common within LCU 11. These unique attributes of the site will ensure that the proposal will be visually contained and not perceivable in the wider landscape context. And Mr. Denny and Mr. Hearn generally agree that the site and the neighboring properties are an exception to this open rolling pastoral context. In terms of the existing consents on the site, the site contains a registered building platform that was approved via RM 060652 and varied in 2010. The existing consent was granted to establish the building platform, but also to construct a residential dwelling within that platform along with associated earthworks and landscaping. So it was more than a subdivision consent with a um, building platform, it also was a land use consent or is a land use consent with specific, very specific um, rights to construct a specific dwelling. This dwelling has not been built, but it is my submission that the existing consent has been given effect to because the building platform has been constructed and a specific 1082D covenant has been registered. It's my submission that the registration of the building platform and the covenant has crystallized the legal right for the applicant to construct the dwelling and to carry out the related earthworks and landscaping. And there's no evidence of any intention of the applicant to abandon the rights conferred by the existing consent. Rather, the registration of the building platform and the covenant demonstrate the clear intention of the applicant to construct the consented dwelling. Now, this issue was subject to a further information request from the council during the processing of this application. And in response, we provided a, a detailed letter. I've appended that to my submissions at Appendix 1. And that letter sets out the detail of the legal authority upon which we rely um, at, in coming to our position that the existing consent has been given effect to in full. But it's my submission that as the existing consent has been given effect to, the construction of the dwelling can be carried out as right and therefore forms part of the receiving environment when considering the effects of this proposal. So relevantly, this requires the commissioners to consider the effects of the proposal as if the consented access way and servicing were constructed and the consented dwelling constructed on the building platform on proposed lot one. Can I stop you and ask you a question about this? Yes. Okay. I read your um, legal opinion. Mm. And, um, that given effect to does not require the consented work to be fully completed or operational. The physical works are not necessarily required. Now, my understanding is that in giving effect to a consent, you're right, you can give effect to part of it and not to the other part. 
that's, that's acceptable. But at a certain stage, there are discrete elements in consent. And I'm thinking, for example, you get a consent to build a house and a shed. You only build the house within the five years. That doesn't, my understanding is case, well, it doesn't convey you the right to then construct the shed because that has then lapsed. And that is a discrete element, which is completely separate. And is this not a similar situation? I agree with you that with this uh, very discrete element that is completely separate, that that may be the case. But th the basis for our legal opinion here is a very specific building platform that has been registered and the specific conditions that have been registered on the consent notice that tie directly to a specific development. And, Trying to find the, the paragraph of my legal opinion um, that goes to the crux of it. Ah, uh, yes, so paragraph 10C. It's, it's my submission to find that this consent has not been given effect to and full would lead to a somewhat perverse outcome. It would result in specific covenant conditions being registered on the title alongside a building platform of a shape designed to cater for a very specific dwelling, but would leave the applicant unable to complete that development. So I guess in answer to your question, I would submit that this is not one of those situations where the construction of the dwelling is separate from this particular building platform or the covenant to the extent that they could be separated. I saw your letter to Ms. Tahern. Do you know what the council's reaction to it is or whether the council accepts that proposition? That it does form part of the receiving environment on the basis of what you just told us? My understanding is that the council didn't um, object to our position um, and, in fact, when considering the engineer... But taking a step back, this... Letter was provided when the council engineer was considering the effects of the um, construction of the access, etc. And my understanding is that the court, uh, the council, did um, take this legal opinion and into account um, when providing the engineering report, which was what this related to. Okay, please continue with your submissions. I, I think if I, I could just add to that point, um, if the commissioners uh, did take a different view for any reason to the applicant on this point, there is still a building platform on lot one um, and a strong likelihood that a building would be constructed on that. And so therefore, considering the Hawthorne test, the commissioners st should still consider this proposal in light of that building platform. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, moving on, Commissioner Baker, I wasn't going to take you through the details of the proposal, which is the next section, but I'm happy to do so if you'd prefer. No, I'm comfortable for you not to do that. I think the areas where I would, um, you've obviously got amendments to propose landscaping, and I understand what the amendments are. Where I'm slightly unclear is in the evidence that we've been provided, who has and hasn't considered those amendments? Yes, that's a good question. So in the evidence that you have before you, uh, the applicants, experts, so Mr. Freeman and Mr. Skelton have obviously considered those amendments. Um, Ms. Terhern, the 42A report author, has considered them, um, but Mr. Denny's landscape report was provided prior to the amendment, so uh, he may have an update to that um, during this hearing uh, in consideration of the amendments made. That was my understanding, thank you. So if I move on to paragraph 20, Sure. Oh, 22, I would have thought. Oh, 
Yeah, yes, that's, that's fine. I simply at 20 wanted to note that the servicing and infrastructure has been deemed feasible by the council um, and that the activity statuses are agreed by the paying experts before you. Um, and on to 22. Now the proposal is a non-compliant activity under the proposed plan and therefore is required to pass through one of the 104D gateway tests, which means that the consent may only be granted if you're satisfied that either the minor effects test or the policy test is met. And if the proposal can satisfy one of these tests, the matter section 1041 of the RMA must be had regard to in determining whether to grant or refuse consent under 104B of the RMA. In terms of the minor effects test, this is confined to adverse effects only. And whether the effects are minor is to be determined after having regard to any mitigation of effects that might be achieved by imposing conditions. So this includes the landscaping conditions and amendments that have now been proposed by the applicant. In terms of the policy test, this requires an application not to be contrary to the objectives and policies of the operative and proposed plans. So it has to meet both plans, not one or the other. And the High Court has recently found that contrary to objectives and policies means opposed in nature different or opposite, repugnant or antagonistic. So it's a higher standard than just inconsistent with. And whether an activity is contrary to the objectives and policies of a plan is to be considered on a fair appraisal of the objectives and policies as a whole. So as a consent authority, you may, must consider all of the plan provisions comprehensively and so far as possible, reconcile them where they appear to be pulling in different directions. Following the judgment of the Supreme Court in the King Salmon case, specific or directive provisions that set environmental bottom lines may warrant greater weight and determine the outcome of an application. However, as I submit later on in these submissions, it's my case that the PDP policies do not set such a bottom line in terms of an 80 hectare minimum. Well, they don't now, do they? That's... Uh, it's my submission that even if the current uh, policy 24.2.1.1 is um, taken into account, it still doesn't set such a bottom line. And there's, there's case law on that, which I will um, address in, in a moment. Is that the Braille versus QLEC that you're going to address? Yes, that's correct. Right. So it's my submission that the adverse effects of the proposal will be more will be no more than minor, and that the proposal is not contrary to the objectives and policies of either the operative plan or the proposed plan. Therefore, the proposal can pass through the gateway test and be granted. At the next section, I um, set out the key considerations under 104 and 106. And again, I don't intend to take you through this in detail, um, except to note at paragraph 31, that the Environment Court has held that section 104 adopts an open-ended approach to the weight that's been attached to relevant matters. So no matter under 1041 requires primacy over another matter. And the matters of it to be given such weight as a consent authority sees fit in the circumstances. Now, this potentially assists you with a, a tricky position that, that you're in in this situation where you've got a current version of the PDP, um, and in particular 24.2.1.1, uh, where the court has made a strong indication that that policy will change, but has not made a final decision on that yet. Um, th this case law allows you, in, in your consideration, to give that potentially more weight than the current version of the PDP, which is, in, in my submission, now outdated. And at 32, I simply note that we accept there's a limited permitted baseline in this case, given um, 
subdivision, uh, construction of dwellings, etc., under the ODP and PDP require resource consent. However, there is some permitted baseline in terms of earthworks under the PDP. Uh, paragraphs 34 and 35, I simply set out the relevant authority on cumulative effects, um, the reason being that cumulative effects have been discussed in the 42A report. However, again, I'll leave that as read um, and don't intend to take you through that. Um, no, actually, I would like you to take us through that. I think that's quite an important point. Certainly. So the direct cumulative effects of the proposal on the neighbouring property at 324 Lower Shot of a Road or the neighbouring site have been raised by Ms. Tehern in the Section 42A report. And here I simply note that in terms of the law, cumulative effects are included in the definition of effect in Section 3 of the RMA and that the courts have given um, some description as to what this concept is, noting that it is any one incremental change which may be insignificant in itself, but at some point in time or space, the accumulation of these in insignificant effects becomes significant. Um, it's often an issue uh, in circumstances where, um, or, or the term threshold is often used, where a particular landscape has a, has a threshold and a consent authority must consider whether the a particular application falls below that threshold or simply tips it over the edge. And as discussed below in my submission, um, with the proposed amendment, it is my submission that the cumulative effects of this proposal on the neighbouring site are no more than minor. So the threshold in this case is not met. Just on that point, I noticed that Mr Eaton has raised or alleged not that his submission that his property has similar characteristics in terms of hummocks and terracing and such like, and that he could have a series of one hectare lots along. That may be something that will become apparent in our site visit in due course, but that issue has also been raised by him as well as Mr. Hearn. Yes, and I see that as a slightly different issue, um, which I, again, I do address uh, a little bit later in my legal submissions. Um, but Mr. Eaton's suggestion is around a, what I would call a future speculative proposal that may or may not be made in the future. Um, and as I will come to uh, shortly, the courts have made it clear that effects of that nature are not relevant to a consent authority's decision um, because a future potential application for consent does not form part of the receiving environment. So, in this case, Mr. Eaton doesn't have an application um, or any development right. Um, so therefore, what he does in the future is not relevant to your consideration. And, and the second point that I would make. Oh, it wouldn't be relevant as a precedent, in fact, surely. Yes, and that's the, the next point that I um, was to make is that with the new, uh, newly minted or, or soon to be minted and um, policy framework in the Wakatipu Basin, it directs um, you to look at whether or not each particular proposal and each particular site maintains and enhances the relevant LCUs. So when Mr Eaton comes to apply for his consent, uh, that consent will receive the same scrutiny that this consent is receiving in terms of does it meet what is envisaged for the relevant LCU in terms of his site. Um, and that will be the process that he will go through. Um, it, we can't speculate as to what the outcome of that decision will be. So are you saying to us that the new policy framework directs us not to look at a landscape as a whole, but to look just at a site? Because I understood reading the court's decision, they did, there's a two level thing where you, you look at the LCUs and this LCU and its neighbours as a whole, sort of as a first level, and then look at this LCU specifically as a second level consideration. The answer is no, that's not my point. point. My, my point is that every application will be assessed on its own merits in the context of the policy direction of the Wakatipu Basin Rural Amenity Zone. Okay. It, and the commissioners do not have the information as to 
what Mr Eaton's how Mr Eaton's proposal will a be assessed against that policy framework, and secondly, that a, a future consent that may or may not be made is not relevant to decision making in this case. Well, well, that brings me back to my first point. You keep saying it's not relevant to decision making. I accept that it's not relevant to cumulative effects, but um, precedent has been identified as a matter. Are you going to address this on precedent later on in your submissions? Uh, yes, I am. And it's the position of the applicant and also the 42A report author that in terms of precedent, each new application can be assessed against the objectives and policies of the Wapitiba Basin Amenity Zone and, and decided on the basis of those provisions. So, in essence, while precedent is a factor in decision making, when you've got a clear, descriptive, comprehensive policy framework, that is what the consent authority's decision needs to focus on because the next application will also be considered in light of that comprehensive policy framework, which reduces the need to give effect to or to give weight to precedent effects because we can rely on the plan to do its job. Yes, that's exactly what precedent is. We follow the framework and we reach a conclusion. What, what precedent is is saying, or my understanding anyway, is saying if we follow the plan and reach the conclusion on this one, we are going to follow the plan and reach the same conclusion potentially on other sites. That's what precedent is. So that's exactly what you're saying, and that makes it relevant, surely. Yes, and what I would say is that the overriding principle of Wakatupa Basin Amenity Zone is that proposals that enhance and maintain landscape character and visual amenity um, are able to be granted. And therefore, Mr Eaton's future applications, if they are ever made, would be assessed against that same threshold or that same principle. Uh, I think we'll move on. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think we know what you're saying. Right, so environmental effects, in terms of these effects, there's a large amount of agreement between Mr Freeman and Ms Tehern as to the effects of the proposal. In particular, the experts agree that the following aspects of the proposal are acceptable. The wider effects of the application on the landscape character and rural amenity of the wider Wakatipu Basin. The effects of the rural amenity on all neighbouring properties with the exception of the neighbouring site, which I will come to shortly. Access and connectivity, infrastructure and servicing, natural environment and cultural values, earthworks and natural hazards. And the remaining issue raised by the 42A report relates to the direct cumulative and rural amenity effects of the proposal on the neighbouring site. Before I come to that point, I briefly address you on the broader landscape character and visual amenity effects of the proposal. So most, both Mr Freeman and Ms Tehern agree that the wider visual landscape character and amenity effects of the proposal are no more than minor and acceptable. The above agreement between the planning witnesses takes into account the amendments to the proposal made by the applicant to address the issues raised in the report by Mr Denny. The conclusions of the planning witnesses are consistent with the opinion of Mr. Skelton. Mr. Skelton has comprehensively considered the landscape and visual effects of the proposal and concludes that they have been appropriately mitigated. And this is for the following reasons. The site is visually contained by existing vegetation and landform. The approximate 80 metre separation between the proposal and the neighbouring site is sufficient to maintain the broader rural character and spaciousness. The proposal will enhance the existing vegetation pattern on the site and maintain the enclosed character of the site. And that the proposed building platform will not be visible from any public place except from distant elevated views from the surrounding mountains. 
And Mr Denny agrees that the proposal avoids the more sensitive pastoral areas. So overall, it's my submission that the landscape setting of this proposal is unique within the broader LCU 11, and that Mr Freeman and Mr Hearn are correct in their conclusions that the wider visual landscape and amenity effects of the proposal are acceptable. Where the difference of opinion lies between Mr Freeman and Ms Hearn is in terms of the direct effects of the application on the neighbouring properties. Because Ms Hearn's view that the proposal will decrease the sense of spaciousness and rural amenity currently experienced by the neighbouring site. When coming to this conclusion, Ms Hearn focuses on what she states to be the proximity of the proposed building platform to the dwelling on the neighbouring site. It's my submission that the proposal will not result in an appropriate rural amenity effects on the neighbouring site and that the building platform is at an appropriate distance from the site. The following elements of the proposal are relevant. The fact that the existing hedge that runs partially along the southern boundary of lot two is proposed to be augmented with an additional hedge that will be maintained to a height of 3.5 metres. This new hedge will provide an effective buffer of a future residential dwelling on lot two when viewed from the neighbouring site and will not further enclose the neighbouring site, which is demonstrated by um, a helpful cross-section that Mr Scouchen includes in his brief of evidence. The proposed evergreen trees and additional planting along the western boundary of lot two will be maintained to a height between six and eight metres. And this condition of consent is supported by the landscape report of Mr Denny. The building platform on lot two is proposed to be located approximately 86 metres from the existing neighbouring dwelling and 52 metres from the neighbouring site boundary. And finally, the access way for the proposed building is located on north away from the neighbouring site, limiting any adverse effects from traffic movements to and from the proposed building. So it's my submission that the combination of the distance from the neighbouring site, the topography of the site and the proposed landscaping will be sufficient to mitigate the relevant rural amenity effects. The separation of the proposed building platform from the neighbouring site will reduce any potential impact on spaciousness and will have the result that the views from the neighbouring site will not be impacted. Possible glimpses of a future residential unit within pro proposed lot two will be marginal at most and the proposed distance between the building platform and the neighbouring site will also mitigate any noise disturbance effects. Now, at this point, I want to address a, a point made in Ms Hearn's summary that she filed yesterday. If, if you've had a chance to, to, to look at that, and if not, um, I'm talking about her statement at Paragraph 1.7. So, so what was that again you're referring to? Mr Hearn filed a summary yesterday about the recent Environment Court interim decision. I don't think we've received that. I have one of those applications. Excuse me, Commissioners, I'll just print that off and bring it into you now. Thank you. Uh, would you like to wait for that, Commissioner Baker? Please to look at it, yes. Yes. Yes, we'll have a moment of adjournment. All right, we'll thank you.
Right, if everybody's back, we will reconvene. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Now, before the break, I, I was addressing paragraph 1.7 of Ms. Tithon's summary, um, which you now have before you. And it, simply to note that Ms. Tithon, um, when referencing the interim decision, suggests that um, it is it's the court's intention that the Wakatipu Basin Rural Amenity Zone sets an expectation for landowners of one dwelling per 80 hectares. Um, I submit that that is not the intent of the court's interim decision, um, but rather the interim decision, and in particular the change to 24.2.1.1, directs a comprehensive assessment of each proposal against landscape character and visual amenity effects in terms of the LCUs. Um, and so it's a qualitative assessment of each proposal that must be made um, as opposed to a blunt expectation of 80 hectares in every situation. So are you saying that a non-complying activity status does not set an expectation? That's correct. I, my submission is it's the objectives and policies of the plan that direct what the outcomes of development are to be. And in this case, those objectives and policies are directed at maintaining and enhancing rural amenity and landscape character. And that the courts made a deliberate shift to remove the required 80 hectare minimum policy. Yes, the, yeah, I think I remember reading the, the reasoning for it very briefly this morning in the decision. Yes, um, that, that's correct. And we visit that so we understand it, but um, mm. certainly it's unusual. I understand they made it discretionary. Um, but yes, we, yes. I have to say my brain hasn't quite processed that yet, mm. but something we'll have to do. I think the way I was reading it was that the policy allows for that that. Um, consideration that you're talking about and that consideration certainly should be made but that the supporting rule remaining non-compliant suggests that the expectation is that generally um, we can expect 80 hectares to be maintained as a um, general situation. That would be the, the, the um, starting point of the thought process. Uh, yes, the starting point of the thought thought process, but would not go so far as to say it's an expectation. Rather, I would submit, and I'll come to this when I talk about to the Braille decision, but it's a higher level of scrutiny below 80 hectares in relation to the objectives and policies of the plan, but it is the objectives and policies um, that need to drive those expectations as opposed to the rule itself. The rule is simply a trigger for greater scrutiny to be applied. Now, moving on, um, so we're still on the effects of the neighbouring, onto the neighbouring landowner. The 42A report records that the owner of the neighbouring site made a submission on the proposal that was subsequently withdrawn due to being in breach of a non-complaints covenant. Now, uh, given this reference, uh, I think it's important to, to raise the context and the nature of this covenant um, for the commissioners. The covenant referred to by the 42A report is a private agreement between the applicant and the neighbouring landowner, which is the contained covenant. It's a very specific agreement which records um, an agreement from the neighbouring landowner not to submit against an application to divide this particular site into two allotments. 
um, the private covenant also records an agreement from the applicant not to construct a dwelling within 50 metres of the neighbouring site for a period of seven years, um, but that date is now passed. Regardless, the proposal complies with the terms of this private agreement. Um, and the private agreement was made in relation to the settlement of an appeal that the applicant made against a subdivision on the neighbouring site. So uh, the point that I wanted to raise for you is that this is a different sort of agreement than the type of covenant we often see on titles where a developer places a, a covenant on a purchaser's title that says you cannot um, oppose any future subdivision that I ever do. Uh, rather, this is a agreement between two Oh, just to clarify that, I understand you're referring to the Logies property, is that right? Yes, that's correct. They are on the Speargrass Flat Road side of this property, so they're to the north, aren't they? Is that correct? I believe they're to the south. I thought that's where you um, yeah, were, uh, what, Mr. Um, Eaton's property is to the south. Uh, I understand Mr. Eaton's property is to the east, oh, to the west, sorry, Commissioner. Um, oh. So the Lodge's property uh, also accesses off Lower Shotover Road at 324 Lower Shotover Road. Okay. Yeah, because we're listening to this, as I understand the situation, some years ago the subdivider entered into an agreement that whereby the neighbour would not object to a subdivision of more than two, uh, less than two, of up to two lots, I'll put it that way, and that has now expired, that agreement, and therefore it has no relevance to what we have to consider, and except to the extent that they, um, that, as I understand it, Logos have withdrawn their submission anyway. Uh so it's not correct that the uh, covenant has expired. The, the only part of the covenant that has expired is the requirement for our for the applicant not to build within 50 metres. Um, the requirement for the neighbouring property or the lodges not to submit against an application uh, remains. And yes, you're correct that the submission has been withdrawn, um, but it's my submission that this covenant remains relevant in terms of the amount of weight that you give effects on the neighbouring site. The reason being that through entering a private agreement, the lodges have a reasonable expectation that this development um, would occur. And some case law, which I submit to be in support of that proposition, which I set out at paragraph 47, the most recent case is a Waiheke Island Air Park Resort case. And in that case, the Environment Court found that an agreement between two parties, that one would not oppose a development to be a relevant factor to consider. And in that case, the court went so far as to find that the agreement not to oppose actually constituted an effective party approval and therefore didn't consider effects on that person at all. Okay, now, so I is that uh, normal circumstances, they're, they're not a submitter, so we don't have to take their effects on them into account. Um, they haven't given their written approval, but in effect, they have given their written approval by being a party to this agreement not to object. And the normal course of events, even if they were to submit it, we take account of effects on the environment and on any other neighbour. But you're saying in this case, we don't, we can't even take any account of effects on that neighbour at all. That's what you're saying, isn't it? Uh, close to that. I, I don't take the proposition quite that far. The reason oh. being that there is some question as to whether a, a non-object government can in fact function as an APA. But what I am saying is that you can consider the private agreement when considering how much weight to give to the effects on the neighbouring property. And that the case law demonstrates that you can, in fact, take this agreement into account in making that weighting decision. 
The other point that I did want to raise was about the submission that the load just made, which has now been withdrawn. Uh, given that it was mentioned in the 42A report, I think it's important for the commissioners to understand the co context of that submission and the fact that it did not oppose the development. In fact, it conditionally supported the proposal. Um, and it raised two key issues. One, uh, the impacts of the uh, vegetation on the... Withdrawn. Surely we should have absolutely no regard to its contents and we certainly shouldn't be hearing submissions from you on it. Thank you, Ms Baker. Um, I simply wanted to raise it given it was pointed out in the 42A report. Um, however, I can move on from that. So uh, overall, it's the applicant's submission that the adverse effects on the neighbouring site will be no more than minor um, and are acceptable. There's just two more points that I want to address you on in terms of the 42A report's um, comments on effects. And the first relates to condition 2.2 of the existing consent. So this condition was offered by the applicant when seeking consent for the building platform on lot one. And it requires that the existing residential dwelling on the site is to be removed at the time that a building is constructed on lot one or on the building platform, which will, is proposed to be on lot one. Mr. Hearn raises a concern that the establishment of the proposed building platform would be contrary to the intent of this condition. It's my submission that this is an incorrect statement. This is because the condition was volunteered directly in relation to the effects of the consented building platform that currently exists, um, and in particular effects which related to the consented building platform being on a more open part of the site along with the existing dwelling. The condition was not imposed for the purpose of controlling future effects on the site, um, and it wasn't framed in a way to suggest that this was the case. And further, there was no assessment of effects of a potential building on proposed lot two at the time of the imposition of condition 2.2. And the current proposal does not require any amendment to this condition. Uh, it, it's my submission that if the current application was contrary to this condition in any way, an amendment would be, be required, which is not the case. The current proposal can comfortably sit alongside the existence of this condition, um, which relates, in my submission, only to the effects of the building on lot one. I submit that the condition is only relevant to the proposal to the extent that it provides you with assurance that the existing dwelling will be removed at the time that the future building is constructed on proposed lot one. And finally, I come to the point that we were discussing earlier in terms of future unconsented development on neighboring sites. And in this section, I set out some case law on this point. So I note that Ms. Tehern cites Mr. Denny's reference that the proposal may potentially procure, preclude future residential development or subdivision on neighbouring land due to future adverse cumulative effects. And this point has now also been raised in the summary of Mr. Eaton. Uh, as mentioned before, it's my submission that such an outcome is not an effect of the proposal and cannot be considered by the commissioners. This is separate from precedent, which I will also address you again on later, I'm talking about cumulative effects here. I'm saying this is not a cumulative effect. Um, and the Court of Appeal in Dai and Auckland Regional Council has made this clear, stating that there's no obligation for consent authorities to consider what other parties may seek to do in the future in unspecified places and ways in considering whether or not to grant consent. And as I've already submitted, potential future subdivision on neighbouring land is not consented 
or permitted and therefore it cannot be taken into account as part of the receiving environment in a Hawthorne sense. Uh, in terms of conclusion on effects, it's my submission that the effects of the proposal on the wider environment and on neighbouring properties would be no more than minor, and the proposal can therefore pass through the minor effects test in section 104D1A, the RMA. I'll move on to the district plan assessment, and hopefully um, our discussion at the beginning of the hearing will, will make this a little bit more simple to, to take you through. And um, so in order to pass through the policy test in 104D1B of the RMA, the proposal must not be contrary to the objectives and policies of either the operative or the proposed plans. And we submit that the proposal is consistent with the objectives and policies of the operative plan and proposed plan. Therefore, the proposal meets the policy test. Now, in terms of the operative plan, Ms. Tahern and Mr. Freeman agree that the proposal is generally consistent with these objectives and policies, and in particular in relation to maintaining the landscape, character and visual amenity effects. In a sense, there's no disagreement between the experts in terms of the um, wider conclusion that the policy is not contrary to the, or the proposal is not contrary to the operative plan. Uh, I further submit that the proposal is not contrary to the proposed plan when considered as a whole. The purpose of the Wakatipu Basin Rural Amenity Zone is to maintain or enhance the character and amenity of the Wakatipu Basin while providing for rural living and other activities. And integral to the management of the Wakatipu Basin Rural Amenity Zone are the landscape character units. And these are tools to assist with the identification of the landscape character and amenity values that are to be maintained or enhanced. And as I've already taken you through, the majority of the site is in LCU 11 with a small portion in LCU 8. And the absorption capability of both of these LCUs is recorded as low. And, and now I come to a point that we were discussing earlier, Commissioner Baker, as to um, the guidance that the uh, reference to low landscape capability um, has. The High Court has recently provided guidance um, regarding the absorption capabilities of LCUs in the case of Guthrie and Queenstown Lakes District Council. The court held that neither the Resource Management Act or the proposed plan requires the absorption capacity noted in an LCU to be treated as an overriding consideration. Instead, the court found it's for the decision maker to, to decide what weight to assign all relevant parts of the proposed plan, including all parts of an LCU description. The court also noted that the LCU descriptions set out a bro broad scale within the Wakatipu Basin, being divided into only 24 units. And so therefore, while a particular LCU may be identified as having a particular absorption capacity, this does not prevent there being potential for individual sites being able to be developed while maintaining and enhancing landscape character and visual amenity values as a whole. The court stated that an assessment specific to each proposed site is required. <coughs> So, and that then takes me back in paragraph 64 to the consent order that I introduced to you at the beginning of the hearing. So, Ms. Hopkins, so, the Guthrie decision would have been issued prior to that consent, uh, not the consent order, sorry, prior to the decision on um, the 12th of April, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So when the High Court is talking about how um, how the absorption capacity should be looked at, it doesn't have the benefit of the quite considerable attention that's been given to it in that decision, does it? That, that's correct. Are you talking about the Court's interim decision or the consent order? Interim decision. So the interim decision, it seems to me, but that could just be my interpretation, that the interim decision has quite, pays quite a lot of um, importance on that particular aspect because that is the basis on which the four-tier um, system, which you have um, brought our attention to at the beginning, is brought in. 
So that has, seems to have increased in importance compared to when the court made the Guthrie decision. I agree that the interim decision was made after the Guthrie decision. Um, however, I'm not sure that I agree that the interim decision would change what the High Court has said here. Uh, the High Court is looking at how you deal with the LCU descriptions. The, the way that the, the Environment Court has used the capability or absorption capacity to create a, a new policy framework which essentially enables more development than was in the PDP where you're moderate and above but I don't think that by doing that it changes the way that we're intended to apply the LCUs for, for low so I would say that the High Court um, precedent remains valid well, it may have been given some, or perhaps unintentional, effect through the consent order on LCU 11, which seems to have refined, if I use that term, uh, the descriptions within that unit. Yes, and, and that was the point that I was going to take you to next at paragraph 64, um, acknowledging the new changes to LCU 11 that have now been made and that the new description of the LCU 11 now acknowledges that localised hollows, benches and terraces with mature exotic vegetation provide opportunities for that LCU to absorb further development. Um, and in my submission, that part of the new description is directly relevant um, to the application for this proposal, given the nature of the proposal site. And At paragraph 65, as demonstrated in the evidence of Mr. Freeman and Mr. Skelton, and also agreed by Ms. Tehern, the proposal maintains the landscape character and visual amenity values identified in LCU 11. And I submit is also consistent with the character and amenity values identified in LCU 8. Turning to the objectives and policies, with the exception of um, or the PDP policy 24.2.1.1 and the subdivision policies that refer to an 80 hectare minimum lot size, it's agreed by the planning experts that the proposal is not contrary to the policies of the PDP when considered as a whole. And in particular, Ms. Tehern considers the proposal is not contrary to policy 24.2.1.3 which seeks to ensure subdivision and development maintains or enhances the landscape character and visual amenity values of, L of the LCUs. Now, the Ms. Tehern considers the policy proposal to be contrary to 24.2.1.1 and the relevant subdivision policies because it does not achieve an 80 hectare minimum. But it's my submission that this conclusion they also properly account for the objectives and policies of the Wakatipu Basin Amenity Zone and the wider PDP as a whole. And at paragraph 70, I address the Todd and Queenstown Lakes District Council decision of the Environment Court. So as noted, whether an activity is contrary to objectives and policies of the plan is to be considered on a fair appraisal of objectives and policies as a whole. Recent case law, being the Todd decision, has made it clear that policy 24.2.1.1 does not so go so far as to set an obligatory environmental bottom line of 80 hectares in every case. In Todd, it, Todd concerned an appeal against the decision of the council to grant consent for a two lot subdivision in LCU 11, and a determinative issue for the court was the application of the 80 hectare minimum net site area regime. The court observed, observed that the clear direction in 24.2.1.1 could make it difficult to meet the policy gateway test in 1041B. However, it held that the assignment of a minimum lot size does not make subdivision below this um, amount inherently unconsentable 
Rather, it held that the purpose of the 80 hectare minimum and associated policy demanded close scrutiny of sub scrutiny of subdivisions below this in terms of their suitability, location, scale, intensity, design, and cumulative effects, and the purpose of the Walker River Basin Rural Amenity Zone. Yeah, I think that was um, I think it's paragraph 25 of that Tom decision, Tom Blackler one. So it sets out a series of criteria they put into that, that the court applied. Um, and that seems to have found its way into the court's final decision. There's a bit of a startling similarity with the way the court was heading with that Blackler appeal in paragraph 25 of that. I think you called it Todd here. And yeah. ultimately ended up in the um, decision on the 12th of April. Okay. Yes, I would suggest that the decision on the 12th and April is continuing on this theme, but amends the objectives and policies of the plan to make it clearer that this is the intent. So the Todd decision, um, I would say, reads the intent of the plan into the policies, and then the interim decision directs amendments to the policies um, in order to ensure that that intent is properly prescribed. Yeah. Also, in fairness to Mr. Ms. Tahoon, her, her paragraph 69, it looks like she was looking at policy 24211 prior, as it was prior to the court's decision. So the policy's now gone. You've got an 80 hectare rule, but the policy saying it has to be 80 hectare is not there anymore. Yeah, I, I do think we need to be a, a little bit careful about that, given the court's decision on the policy is technically provisional. Although I submit that it deserves significant weight, the change doesn't form part of the PDP. Yeah, I understand that. So uh, I, I would submit, yes, that this, um, the way that the court has addressed the policy in Braille remains relevant, um, as well as the change. But we need to consider both. No, no, I understand, actually, you're technically right there. It isn't actually a final decision, so I couldn't rephrase it quite that way. but. Um, if weight is placed on what yes. the court decided, then yes. that's, that's absolutely overtake by the end, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. At paragraph 71, I simply note that the Environment Court's decision um, is subject to appeal essentially to the Court of Appeal. However, in my submission, as it currently stands, it warrants um, due consideration. So that's the Environment Court decision in the Todd and Blackler case. Yeah. So overall, it's my submission that um, the 80 hectare minimum lot size is to be considered as a starting point for decision makers and inconsistency with policy 24.2.1.1. And there's a typo there, does not constitute a bar for, to further consideration of the proposal against the policies of the proposed plan as a whole in light of the Wakatupu Basin Rural Amenity Zone purpose. And as set out in the evidence of Mr Freeman, the proposal meets the intention of the Wakatupu Basin Rural Amenity Zone as a whole as it maintains the character of the relevant LCUs. And that this conclusion must be considered in the light of the purpose statement of Wakatupu Basin Rural Amenity Zone that seeks to provide for appropriate rural living. The proposal maintains the landscape character and rural amenity of the Wakatupu Basin and therefore can be considered as not contrary to the objectives and policies of the PDP and considered as a whole. Now, in this next section, I, I take you again through the change to policy 24.2.1.1 in the Barnhill decision. Um, however, we've addressed that in some depth. So unless you'd like me to, to take you there again, we can probably move forward. No. No, no, thank you. Oh, sorry, just one very brief question. Barnhill, was that, was, is, is that simply a term for one of the people that was subjecting to the change 24 provisions? Yes, that's correct. It'll be uh, alphabetical. I, uh, to be completely correct, I probably should have referred that to Barnhill Corporate Trustee and others um, in terms yeah. of the name of the case. But yes, it'll be the, the first alphabetical name in the list of people opposing. That's clear now. No, thanks very much. 
So if I turn to waiting, which we briefly discussed earlier, um, it's my submission that the outcomes under the operative plan and the proposed plan should be the same and consent should be granted under both. However, for the sake of completeness, I do address waiting. Um, and as we have discussed, while Chapter 24 of the PDP remains subject to appeals, it's Mr Hearn's view that predominant weight should still be given to the PDP. Um, now, this was obviously her view expressed in the 42A report before she was able to consider Barnhill. So I um, would need to, should, should need to comment on whether that view is maintained. Um, however, I note that things have moved on. And in the process of appeals on the Wakatipu Basin Rural Amenity Zone, the council provided evidence seeking to amend the 80 hectare minimum policy regime. And in light of that evidence provided by the council, the Environment Court has made a shift away from the um, requirement to maintain 80 hectares in policy 24.2.1.1. At paragraph 81, while current circumstances present a complex planning situation, there is a clear direction from the court that the policy framework of the decisions version of the PDP is unsuitable and needs to change. And in light of that, we subject we submit that you should be cautious about affording any significant weight to the current version of the PDP, and in particular, policy 24.2.1.1. Now, this takes me back to, to a point I made earlier in terms of weighting of the limbs of 104. And it's possible that in this complex situation, you find that it's more appropriate to give weight to the court's direction and the Barnhill decision over the PDP and potentially the ODP as well, uh, given we have moved on from both of those policy frameworks. And moving on, I briefly address the higher order planning documents and note that both planning experts agree that the proposal gives effect to the relevant um, proposed and operative RPSs um, and that in terms of part two, this is a matter relevant to your consideration given the current complex planning situation and that both planning experts agree that the proposal is consistent with part two of the RMA. I then turn to briefly address the submissions on the proposal. Now, Otago Regional Council has made a submission uh, and I, I won't take you through this part of my submissions, but simply to note that the Otago Regional Council submission um, differs from the planning assessment of Ms. Tehoun, um, and in my submission is inconsistent with the conclusions of the 42A report. So OIC raises a number of issues that uh, Ms. Tehoun considers are not relevant. In particular, paragraph 89. So OSC raises the issue of precedent and integrity effects, which we discussed earlier. Um, and here I just wanted to point out that Mr. Hearn is of the view that any precedent uh, is of the view that there's not a precedent issue in this case and states that further applications will be considered on their merits on a case-by-case -case basis against a comprehensive planning framework of the Wakatipu Basin Rural Amenity Zone. And we agree with that conclusion. Uh, and if it's helpful, I can take you to that part of the 42A report. Oh, I don't think that's necessary. We, we have read it, so we're familiar with what it says. Yeah, I think it's just a also note that the uh, court briefly mentioned the relationship between Objective 20. 4.2.1 and the Otago Regional Planning Documents in this decision, so we can also assess that as well. Thank you. Uh, and final, turning to the Wakatipu Equities Limited submission, uh, I list there the issues raised by the submission and note that the shot of a trust has considered the concerns raised and as a response has proposed to remove wilding pines um, that are part of the proposal. Further, Mr. Hearn agrees with the evidence of Mr. Skelton and Freeman that there will not be inappropriate effects on Wakatipu Equities Limited. 
So in conclusion, I submit that the proposal, while it does not achieve an 80 hectare minimum net site area, when the relevant objectives and policies are considered as a whole, it is consistent with both the operative and proposed district plans, meets the section 104D gateway tests, and maintains and enhances landscape character units 8 and 11. The adverse effects of the proposal will be minor and the commissioners can be satisfied that it is appropriate to grant consent for the proposal. Thank you very much, Ms. Hockley. Um, I really just have one question for you, because obviously we've already grilled you quite a lot through this. Um, you are submitting to us that um, we are free under um, other matters on the 104 to give weight to whichever part of the, whichever version of the PDP suits we consider most appropriate. And you're suggesting to us that this is that in the interim decision. Um, given that the interim decision is a provisional, um, includes a provisional policy, I would assume that if we do decide that that is the most appropriate one to give most weight to, we should not just be considering the wording of that policy, but we should be considering the entire decision with all the reasoning around it. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would agree with that. Uh, that would have to be the case given we don't have the final wording. Okay, okay. thank you. No, I don't have Okay, we will move on to your first expert. Yes. Thank you. So I'll call Ms. Skelton. Hello, can you hear me? Good morning, Mr. Skelton. Good morning. Good morning. Um, well, I prepared, I prepared a summary. Do you want to go, Catherine? Uh, yes, we haven't received it, I don't think. I've got one, yeah. Have we got it? Um, oh yes, I think maybe I have. Uh, no, that's. Skelton, I've got, I've got Mr. Freeman. What's Freeman and Skelton? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's okay. Um, might get, oh, look. Oh, that's okay. Um, right, I might get you to just read that out, Mr. Skelton, and I will get a copy uh, from the administration team. It's quite brief, Commissioner. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll start on, on paragraph five. Um, paragraphs one through four just uh, set up my qualifications and experience and involvement. Paragraph five. This proposal seeks to subdivide the site into lot one at 6.07 hectares and lot two at 1.2 hectares. A building platform is proposed near the center at the proposed lot two, and a landscape plan seeks to maintain and enhance the surrounding vegetated context of lot two, which provides a high degree of containment of the site. The site is part of a broad plateau-like feature in the northwestern edge of landscape character unit 11, the Slope Hill Foothills. This northwestern edge is different than the balance of LCU 11 and that it is a low lying, it is low lying, holds a woodland character and is at the intersection of three LCUs or near the intersection of three LCUs. The location of the proposed building platform will see the future building set within a hollow of the landform's humps and hollows at the edge of the plateau in a location that is not visible from the surrounding landscape. I consider the proposed building platform will not be visible as the existing landform and existing proposed vegetation contribute to providing a high degree of screening from surrounding public and private places. I do note that it is visible from parts of the Wakatupu Equities site, um, but uh, Mr. Eaton's uh, supplementary um, submission uh, raises no issues with that visibility. Uh, the proposal will maintain the rural character of LCU 11 and the wider landscape by ensuring buildings are set an appropriate distance apart, such that a sense of spaciousness associated with rural character is maintained. 
Rural living type development will be concentrated in a part of the LCU, which has a higher capacity to absorb development. I, I note that um, with the recent environment court interim decision, uh, further changes to the description of LCU 11 um, are part of the, appeal, the appeals process, which is still before the court. Um, I'm involved in part of that appeals process. And there are at least three other appellants um, seeking change changes to that schedule, um, 24.8, um, and is part of the appeals process. So I don't know what more can change or why the court uh, released their, um, their interim decision. Uh, but as far as I'm aware, and I have put in a, con uh, a call to my, um, my law the lawyers that I'm working with on that, those appeals process to figure out what the status is there. And I might have a bit more information to share with Ms. Hockley um, later on in the day. So you're referring, when you say interim decision, are you referring to the consent order? Yes, sorry, the consent order. Which, which could lead to further changes to the descriptions in LCU 11. That's right. Um, picking up, the proposal will also maintain the character of LCU 8, which is the spear grass flats just to the north of the site or of the, the building platform, as no new built development is proposed in that part of the site in, or in LCU 8. Following notification, several changes have been made to the application, most notably adding a Leland Cypress hedge near the site's southern boundary, which is the shared boundary with the Logas, and adding detail to the landscape plan to ensure the mitigating and anticipating effects of, vegeta of vegetation are maintained. The site's existing and proposed vegetation will ensure the proposed building platform will not be visible from outside the site. This includes from the neighboring properties. Um, from the Wakatipu Equity site, there's, there's significant vegetation proposed on that eastern boundary. Um, as well as vegetation proposed basically to enclose the site every uh, direction except for to the north where there's already an approved building platform. Paragraph 10, the proposed building platform will not be visible from the Logas property. Um, I might just make some clarification there. So our, uh, the, the southeast and eastern portion of the building platform um, is the, the highest portion of, of the building platform itself. And my, uh, on, is my section B on page 16 of my evidence in chief, evidence in chief shows that there, um, there is a small potential of that very high point of the building platform to be visible. Um, Mr. Denny's uh, report, uh, photo two on page eight of his evidence um, shows he had, the, he had the benefit of visiting the, the Logos property, I did not. But that shows a, uh, I'm not sure where that photograph was taken, but it does show a pole visible through zoom lens, through what seems to be about three different trees, the habit of three different trees. Um, now, I don't know where that photograph was taken. Uh, so in flying the drone, which is part of my evidence in chief, we tried to determine if, if some of that would actually be visible. It's my submission that that far corner of the building platform at its highest point, it's highly unlikely that uh, a future building would be built to its, um, the, the height, the, the maximum building height in that location. Um, that the, the 3.5 meter existing hedge provides significant visual mitigation and the proposed hedge at 3.5 meters in height will um, maintain that, that mitigation. And if it would to be just a half meter higher, there would be no doubt that a future building um, wouldn't be visible or that a future building um, would be well screened by, by the, um, the Leland Cypress Hedge. Picking up at paragraph 10, um, the screening effects of the existing Leland Cypress Hedge on the shared boundary will be maintained through the planting of an additional hedge of the same species. The proposed building platform will be located an acceptable distance, it's 84 meters. Um, from the existing dwelling on the Logas property, such that that property will be adversely affected to a more than, no more than low degree. Um, and I, I, I tend to mean the, uh, the rural, um, rural spacious character as experienced from the Logas, Logas property will be adversely affected to a more than, no more than low degree. The proposal will maintain the landscape's rural values as experienced from the Logas site and from the wider landscape. Overall, I consider the proposal will result in no more than low adverse effects on landscape character and visual amenity. 
and I'm available for any questions that you might have. Okay. Um, yes, I, I just I, I know a lot, a lot of the evidence um, is very much centered on whether or not future buildings are visible or not. In other words, it's about whether things can be seen. And it, it'll, I'm not saying it goes so far as to say if it can't be seen, then it doesn't matter. But there's certainly an overwhelming uh, focus on the visibility of development from outside. Um, You've got here a site which has a sort of a flat area at the front and then a plateau area at the back, which you describe as hummocky. Um, under what we understand with lots one and two, there'll be a, the possibility of, I, th I think I'm correct in saying, a very substantial dwelling on lot one, which would replace the existing dwelling, something of a 1,100 square meters, 1,200 square meters. I think, and, I think about 2,000. Yeah, very, very large. And a 500 square meter dwelling on lot two. Now, I'm just wondering whether you have a view on the intensity of development having regard to LCU 11, because that's creating a node of quite intensive development. Whether or not it can be seen, it is a very intensive form of development in very close proximity on that side. Yes. My opinion there is that that's part of what um, provides a uh, higher capacity for this part of the site to absorb that development because we already have these rural living and anticipated, anticipated rural living, living effects in that part of the LCU, which is at the edge of different LCUs. It's, it's almost a peninsula-like feature um, and that isn't visible from, from the wider landscape, that that actually amalgamates and, and um, locates rural living type development in that uh, that part of the landscape, which has a higher ability to absorb change. Now, if there were to be, it's the spaciousness between the buildings too that also maintains that rural character um, in that, that part of the LCU. Now, the consented building platform is actually predominantly located in LCU 8. Um, so that's part of a different landscape character unit. Uh, that's the line that council's um, consultants have provided. And I don't understand that there's to be any um, dispute or appeals to remove changing the location of that line. Um, but that's as far as I'm aware, and I, I can double check this for you and I will have a look now, that part of the, um, of what is it, lot two or lot one is actually an LCU eight. Okay. Does that feature, that hummocky terrace you refer to, with where the future dwelling on lot two is located, does that extend into neighbouring properties? That feature? Yes, it does. Yes, it goes a little bit into um, Mr. Eaton's, the Wakatipu Equity site, to the uh, to the east, um, to the west. There's a bit of a, a depression or drainage gully, uh, which is heavily vegetated in trees. Um, and that then drops down to meet the, uh, the Hawthorne um, Triangle, um, the alluvial plains of the Hawthorne Triangle. Um, but yeah, that, that sort of depressed land, landform um, does continue just a little bit into uh, the Wakatupuakity site. Um, and I haven't looked at it in detail to the south across the Logas site, but my general understanding of the landscape is then it sort of falls away so it's more of a hummocky landscape there and then it falls away to a alluvial terrace which is where the the hawthorne triangle flatlands come to meet the um the terrace riser of of the slope hill foothills um i read the um course decision in uh, which case you're familiar with because i think you were the landscape architect involved in the blackler application i think you're acting for the blacklers yes i was and um in paragraph 25 of the course decision there, they referred to your evidence and they pointed out that, one, that there were a number of factors that led them to conclude that consent should be granted in that case. I think that was LCU 11 as well, was it? Or was it on the boundary of 8 and 11 again? That's LCU 11, yes. Yeah. It's to the south. Yes, that's right. And they listed a range of factors and they, among them were, they, the, the court said, well, we know that it's the two lots that are being created there, which is about four hectares, were similar in character and scale to those around them. Now, this is a proposal to create a small lot, lot one, which is very small, just one hectare. Is there a similar pattern of lots of that size in, or uh, sorry, around that 
proposed law? Um, in landscape character U, unit 11 in that portion of LCU 11, um, not necessarily. I have provided, is it my, oh, I don't have a figure on it, but at paragraph 27 of my evidence, an actual excerpt from some evidence that we prepared for the Blackler decision for the environment court that sets out the, the spatial patterning and separation of, of buildings in that part of the landscape. Um, that shows that there, there are some smaller lots um, in that part of LCU, and there's also some much bigger lots. Um, the LCU 11 description does say that there's, there's much bigger lots and smaller lots, but overall, the general um, average lot size in LCU 11 is about four hectares. Yeah, if you were to look a little bit just to the um, to the west and south of the subject site, dropping down on, on lots that are adjacent to um, Speargrass Flat and Lower Shot of a Road, there are some very small lots there, um, just small rectangular lots, and all they hold is, is a dwelling in the curtilage. Um, I, so there, there are some smaller lots in the vicinity. Uh, the 1.2 is smaller than the, the general um, average uh, lot size of LCU 11, uh, but it's my opinion that it's part of that balance where you have larger land holdings and smaller land holdings um, that, that make it appropriate. Thank you very much. Um, I probably have a bit of a follow on question from Commissioner Nixon, and it's about the, the difference between the visual amenity and the landscape character. And I think that gets quite confused. Um, so uh, what I'm trying to understand is this landscape character aspect and how much that is reliant on what you can see and what you can't see and how much it is actually reliant on um, other elements. So what is actually going in there? Can you give me some explanation on the, on how that works? Sure. Um, landscape character, it, it doesn't matter if you can see it or not. The, the character is still there. Um, the perception of it is, is, uh, is sort of um, secondary to, to the actual effects on landscape character. Um, speaking to the ruralness, rural is, a, is, a, is generally thinking about the um, separation between buildings, the, the open space between buildings. Um, the, the, really it's, the, it's creating, it's a spatial patterning. Rural is somewhere between, you know, one building per 1.5 hectares, maybe more. It depends on what plan you're looking at. Um, but in terms of this district plan, we know we have precinct, uh, which I think is, a, I can't remember where we're at, but it's a minimum of 6,000 and a minimum average of 1.5, I think is where we're at. And that's, um, that would be rural living. Well, anything beyond that would generally be considered rural in character. Um, it's my opinion that generally it's, we're talking about a wider landscape too. We're not concentrating um, effects on a, on a more localized area. We're looking at all of a, a landscape, whether it's a landscape character unit or the, the landscape defined by the, um, the environment court, which is, you know, it has to have a rectangle of between 1.5 meters and or 1.5 kilometers fit a rectangle between 1.5 kilometers and two kilometers to be judged a landscape in its own right. In this instance, it's my interpretation that we're maintaining rural character of the land, the, the, the application is maintaining the rural character of the landscape and that it's amalgamating rural living development in a part of the landscape, which is invisible, which is part of it, but where it's also in a hump and a hollow, which is sort of down low, and it doesn't adversely affect the wider open character of the landscape and the, the wider patterning of the landscape. Um, if, this, if this lot were to be retained or if, if this application were to be um, refused, the, the overall rural character of LCU 11, in my mind, um, wouldn't change whether it's refused or granted. Um, it's such a small piece of, piece of land. It's already um, 
segmented from the wider landscape in terms of its, uh, or segmented from the, the, the broader landscape. It's a small pastoral unit surrounded by trees, which you can't see from anywhere um, in the middle of, of, of several buildings um, consented and, and constructed. Um, so that's the, 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 that's the character, it's the spatial patterning and density in a lot of ways and the, the, the spaciousness between, um, between buildings and oftentimes clustering them. So you can cluster buildings um, in an area and then have other areas with wider open space then that can also maintain uh, rural character, whether you can see it or not. I hope that helps, Ms. Baker. Yes, that was actually very helpful, thank you. Um, I don't think I had any further questions for you. Um, well, I suppose I do. You're obviously involved in these further appeals on landscape unit 11, on which I, I understand that um, we're all slightly confused how we've got a consent order and then still some appeals. Um, your understanding, what is the scope of those appeals you're still involved in? Uh, well, I'm involved in three of them, actually. Um, so the Burgess appeal is seeking a... Basically, council has not agreed to um, change the landscape line in any location, but the Burgess repeal is seeking to originally sought to bring the landscape character unit um, boundary between the Hawthorne Triangle and LCU 11 to the foot of the foothills so that both the, the flatlands on both sides of Slope Hill Road leading up to the base of the foothills were to become precinct. Um, council hasn't accepted that, and I'm not sure of the status because it's with all the lawyers, but there's, there's a change in the um, capacity rating and that part of the LCU. Um, that, uh, that the it, LCU relevant to this site? No, all of that is south of the Gibson Wine site, which is south of our site. Okay, so that's not, yeah. Not what particularly relevant. And then Mr. Eaton's site, Wakatipu Equities, um, but all three of these, all three of these have changes to the um, schedule 24.8 as part of the appeal. Um, Mr. Eaton's site is seeking a moderate capacity rating on parts of the site. And that's um, those parts of the site have been uh, assessed um, mainly on visibility and existing patterning. Um, and uh, that's we've undertaken a full zone of theoretical. Right. Visibility. Are only relevant to Mr. Eaton's site? Uh, that's only relevant to Mr. Eaton's site, yes. That doesn't apply to us here no. either? No, well, it's the part of the yeah. land immediately east of um, our site is, is subject to that appeal. Yeah, okay, understood. And then the third one that you're involved in? The, the third one is the other side of, um, of East Slope Hill Road, adjacent to uh, the Lake Hayes O&F. Uh, oh, in my opinion, it's completely yeah. irrelevant to, to this yeah. part of the landscape character unit. That's, you know. that's, very, that's very helpful, thank you. Um, so obviously your evidence was prepared prior to the changes that um, is possibly included in terms of the consent order, is that right? It was, yes. Yeah, does, does that, in your summary, you don't seem to have specifically addressed it. I assume you would have, but I just want to check with you. Does it make any, does it change any of your views? It doesn't change any of my views. I think um, the court rightly pointed out that there are those humps and hollows in LCU 11, um, where development could be, where, which I, I'm not sure of the exact wording of the consent order, but it, in my interpretation, it was that had a higher capacity to absorb development or where development could be located. Um, and I think that's almost um, supportive of, of this application. Just following on from what my colleague has asked, does the, the Eaton uh, appeal include the land which he asserts in his submission is also contains humps and hollows next to lot one. It does. Okay, thank you. I have no further questions. No okay. further questions? No. We'll just have a, I'll just mute us for a moment so we can just have a conversation. Mm -hmm.
Okay, we're just going to take a five minute adjournment for comfort break and then we'll carry on with a planned lunch at one, if that's acceptable to everyone. Yes, yep, thank so you, we'll just, Okay, we'll just take a five minute adjournment now. Thank you. If everyone's here, we will resume. And I should move on to Mr. Freeman, Ms. Hockley. Yes, that's correct. Um, on to Mr. Freeman, who appears he may not quite be back yet. Okay, that's all right.
All right, Mr. Freeman, and when you're ready, you can commence. Thank you. Um, I'll just go to my summary statement, and if I can start at paragraph six, if that's okay. Um, the, the site is mostly contained within LCU 11 under the PDP. LCU 11 is a large land area that is characterised by a mix of rural and rural residential land use patterns set amongst an area with a variable sense of openness and naturalness. Within LCU 11, there are areas that are enclosed by mature vegetation and landform, while other parts of the LCU provide views across rolling pastoral lands to distant mountains. The northern corner of the site uh, is located within LCU 8. After completing my statement of evidence, I became aware of the Environment Court uh, decision that formally altered aspects uh, of the descriptions for LCU 11. In my opinion, the amendments to LCU 11 reinforce the fact that LCU 11 is a highly varied landform as a whole. There are two key additions to LCU 11 that are, that are highly relevant to the proposal in my view. Under the title, under the descriptor title, pastoral landscape opportunities and benefits associated with additional development, the following text has been added. Localised hollows, benches and terraces along with mature exotic vegetation provide opportunities to absorb further development in places. Under the description titled environmental characteristics and visual amenity values to be maintained and enhanced, the following text has been added. Throughout the more elevated western flanks, future built development should be cited to exploit the containment provided by existing localised benches, terraces or hollows and the screening influence of mature vegetation. Uh, environmental effects. Mr. Hearn and, I, to Hearn and I largely agree on a range of effects associated with the proposal. From a landscape perspective, we agree that the effects on the landscape character and amenity values of the wider Wakatipi Basin will be acceptable and that the effects on the rural amenity of all neighbouring properties, with the exception of the property located at 324 Lower Shotover Road, will also be acceptable. Mr. Hearn and I also agree that the effects of the proposal from access connectivity, infrastructure servicing, natural environment, cultural values, earthworks, and natural hazards will also be acceptable. Mr. Hearn has raised the issue of adverse cumulative and rural amenity effects of the proposal against the property located at 324 Lower Shotover Road, that's the Logis property. Specifically, it is her view that additional development and intensification of residential activities will decrease the sense of spaciousness and rural amenity presently enjoyed by this adjoining landowner. As outlined in my statement of evidence, the proposal will not result in inappropriate rural amenity effects on the adjoining property through a combination of the distance between the proposed platform and the residential dwelling on the neighbouring property being approximately 80 metres and 52 metres from the southern boundary of lot two. Existing and proposed vegetation, which should be maintained height-wise, sorry, which with such to be maintained height-wise, and the access to the proposed platform is located away from the southern adjoining landowner. In my opinion, the combination of above mitigating factors will ensure that the current sense of spaciousness will not be adversely affected, nor the current rural amenities enjoyed by the adjoining landowner. District Plan Assessment. Mr. Mr. Hearn and I agree that the proposal is not contrary to the relevant objective of policies, policies within the ODP. Specifically, the proposal is consistent with the objective of policies that address the visibility of development in the rural general zone is appropriately controlled. With the exception of policies 24211 and 272134, Mr. Hearn and I agree that the proposal is not as a whole is not contrary to the relevant objectives of the PDP when dealing with the uh, rural amenity zone. The proposal will maintain the landscape character and amenity within the Bokotuku Basin. Further, I consider that, that the proposal will be consistent with the outcomes intended for LCU 8 and 11. I disagree with Mr. Hearn's, Hearn's view on policy 24211 and 27121 and 34 when the objective and policies of the PDP as a whole uh, are considered as a whole, the proposal gives effect to the purpose of the amenity zone. Therefore, the proposal can be considered consistent with objective and policies 
of the PDP. The Environment Court has provisionally amended policy 24211, with the main amendment being the removal of the requirement to adhere to an 80 hectare minimum allotment size in the amenity zone. In my opinion, the proposal accords with the outcomes envisaged by the provisionally amended policy 24211. In my opinion, the proposal meets the effect and policy threshold test of section 104D of the Act, and, and that consent can be granted for the proposal. Conditions. Finally, I note that in my statement of evidence, I address condition 18M, which required an updated landscape, landscape plan. As outlined in my statement of evidence, the requirements of condition 18M are redundant as an updated landscape plan was submitted that addressed Mr. Denny's concerns to my understanding. Having assessed the recommended conditions again, I consider that conditions 18N, O and P should be imposed as a consent notice to be imposed on, on lot two on the basis that landscaping within lot two is to be undertaken in the future as per the requirements of condition 20G. Thank you. Oh, Commissioners, I think you're on mute if you're speaking. Bob had a lengthy um, conversation with him. <laughs> Sorry, I can't answer that question, didn't hear it. All right, all that's end up for nothing. Uh, just a clarification on um, your paragraph 17. Uh, you say here the amendment made by the Environment Court to 24211 being the removal of the requirement to adhere to an 80 hectare minimum of allotment size. So that's, in reality, the 80 hectares still applies at a rules level, but not at a policy level any longer. So that's the difference, isn't it? Yes. So I, I'm not sure where that full question was um, managed to get through because the mute was on. So if we're looking at for the, in the Wakatipu, uh, well, in the amenity, uh, amenity zone, um, if the landscape unit is within a very low, low or low moderate, um, an 80 hectare regime still applies. Um, there are other areas within the amenity zone where um, there potentially will be a discretionary regime for moderate and above and with bespoke minimum and average allotment sizes. That doesn't apply to, to this um, LCU and it doesn't apply to the site. Um, it's an 80 hectare uh, minimum allotment size and if that's breached, which clearly this application does, it's a non-complying activity. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, Mr. Freeman, I do have a couple of questions for you. Oops. My paperwork's all full of bits. Um, I obviously have understood Ms. Hockley's um, submissions on the existing consent. And I am, when I was first reading through this, one of the planning considerations that occurred to me was that the existing consent, RMO6 um, consent, was granted on the basis of, of this site. And um, just temporarily putting to one side whether or not that house can still be built under that consent. Obviously, it was a, a substantial development that was granted. And now there's a, and it hasn't been, um, it hasn't been built. I won't use the words given effect to it, it hasn't been built. We're now proposing to do, um, to subdivide the site and build another house on it. Would it not be, have been appropriate to review the proposal for that building platform on the one at this stage and take that into the whole planning picture? So, um, <clears throat> are you talking about re re reviewing the size of that platform as part of this application, or review the, the the right to build full stop? Well, I would have thought the whole thing because we're looking at the site as a whole. 
Yep. So I would have thought that, that there would have been consideration given to the whole site and what was possible on it and what the ultimate outcome would be. And that doesn't seem to have been the planning approach. Yeah, like in, in lodging the application, we've obviously been very mindful that we've got you know, an existing platform and um, a very large platform at that. Um, so the, the platform itself is about 2,680 square metres. Um, that platform shape does follow the, the consent of dwelling. And if you look at the, the latest landscape plan, um, there's obviously a lot of courtyard in the middle that's considered to be part of the platform. Um, ultimately, the, the limit in building is um, maximum building coverage of 1,260, which is still a large building area. So that said, the, the size of that platform um, or the development potential within that platform was considered in the formulation of, of this application. And I think what um, you know, definitely assists this application for or for the Lot 2 platform is the location of, of the platform, which is in the, the southeastern corner. Um, it's probably the, the best part of the site to, to put another platform because of its location, topography, and uh, existing vegetation. Okay. Let's just add to that. Um, yeah, that, um, just on that point, I guess what we're, we're sort of, what's going through our minds here at the moment, when the original application for that dwelling on what is now proposed to be lot one was made, yep. decision was issued, um, provided for a fairly substantial building platform, even its original iteration, and a provision which the applicant at the time agreed to, to remove the existing house with the aim of ensuring there <coughs> Two houses up on that terrace within what is now lots one and two. But we're now faced with a situation where you are, in fact, ending up with two large dwellings on that original area. It seems inconsistent with what was being uh, contemplated at an earlier stage. Yeah, yeah, look, I, I've got the, look, I hear, hear that, that, that uh, line of thinking, and I've got the benefit that I was um, the planner involved in that application in 06, 07. Um, and so the um, if we're dealing with the existing house and the requirement to remove the house, that was volunteered by the applicant at that stage. Um, and what wasn't the requirement of council and that you have to remove it, but it was volunteered. And primarily the applicant was comfortable with that because that, that dwelling was going and he was going to be building uh, the new house. Um, but moving forward uh, in terms of the, the council side, the, the existing platform and the, the approved house is in the more prominent part of the site. Um, back in 2006-07, the existing dwelling was visible from Lower Shotover Road. Um, the vegetation has obviously um, grown since then. And so really the, the, the focus of that restriction was to have two houses that were, were visible from Lower Shotover Road in that position. So hence um, the restriction to remove the platform. And I don't think um, you know, the covenant was um, designed to control other development within the site. Um, if it did, it would be um, a covenant along the lines of um, there shall only be one house full stop on the site. There should be no further subdivision. Um, you can't do anything further. So that restriction was to, to avoid two houses in the more prominent part of the site. In my view, um, it clearly did not seek to control future development in other parts of the site. Okay, I have another question to you, for you about the vegetation. Um, Ms. Skelton's evidence, which you have relied on, is heavily reliant on the treed area and the vegetation. And Mr. Skelton at various points says he cannot imagine it all being removed despite it being off-site to some extent. Um, I understand that the amended landscape plan to some extent brings vegetation on-site, which is going to provide screening. Um, I'm, I'm not entirely clear from Mr. Skelton's evidence that he is not still relying to some extent on off-site vegetation. What's your view on that? Oh, I think um, you know, the, the likelihood of, of all trees around that site to kind of the south and, and the west being removed is low. Um, can I guarantee that that outcome will occur? No, I can't because I don't own the land. So I think um, what we need to focus on is um, you know, the, the landscaping that 
we um, collectively, the applicant and um, council slash commissioners can control, which is on, on the site. So hence Mr. Denny's recommendation of um, you know, a planted line on the western boundary of lot two. So I think um, you know, if, if it's an issue for the commissioners that um, there needs to be further mitigation on that kind of western side, that's, that's something which can be looked at in terms of additional planting. Um, and potentially um, you've got, that could be within um, lot one. So I think now's an opportunity to go right, let's rely on planting on the site and control that through consent notices in the future. Um, you haven't really addressed the adverse cumulative effects issue which Mr. Hearn raised. Can you comment on that? Uh, sorry, in terms of uh, the neighbor to the cell? Sorry, in terms of? So it's like adverse, adverse cumulative effects, is that to the neighbor to the cell? Um, my understanding is that that is the area that you have identified as the difference between yourself and Mr. Hearn. Um, but you haven't really addressed what your view is on these cumulative effects or how you think we, or, or how we, we should look at these cumulative effects. Um, in my primary evidence, I have done, if you just give me a second, please. I have gone through and looked at the effects in detail in terms of the, the adjoining landowners to sell. So yeah, that so is... interested in the cumulative effects. Okay. If we're looking at the cumulative effects, we've got... Um, so let's just pull this back to basics. If I'm standing on you know, the, the front deck of the adjoining landowner's house, um, looking north, now I have stood on that front deck about probably in 2005, so, but um, with respect, I'll need to rely on, there's a photograph in uh, Mr. Denny's evidence where he has recently stood on, on the property. And if you look at that photograph in the foreground, you'll see um, a hedge. Um, that runs along the boundary, more so into the into the Logis property. Um, hence, why we're looking to put a new hedge in there. So, um, if you're standing on the Logis property, looking north, um, uh, there might be a snippet of a view of uh, the, the southeastern corner of a house in the in the platform lot lot two. Um, based on my uh, last couple of site visits um, to the site. Um, they're not going to see, or it's going to be very difficult to see the existing house that's currently there through through the vegetation growth. growth. And um, if they're going to get views of the a future dwelling on, within the lot one platform, it's going to be very much the same. So in my view, the neighbours are not sitting there or, or in their main living areas looking directly at two houses that can look direct back, look direct back at them. So in my view... Um, I don't think there, there is adverse community effects through either a, a house within lot two, an existing house on lot one, or a house on lot two and a future house on lot, lot one as well. I don't think I have any further questions for you, but I'm just going to check. Oh, the conditions that you are um, raised in your... Um, Summary. So my understanding is that you're saying the landscape report is not going to be, sorry, not the landscape report, the landscaping is not going to be uh, put in place until such time as a dwelling is being built. Is that right? Uh, no, my, my questions about the landscaping conditions are, and uh, I have done a great job of losing the conditions. Um, so in condition, 18, uh, Mr. Hearn has recommended a number of conditions which appears to be a cut and paste from Mr. Denny's landscape report. And in his landscape report, he made a number of rec recommendations to change the landscape plan. And then we subsequently, subsequently changed the plan to suit 
those recommendations. Yep, so, so that's and, 18M. Yeah, yeah. And so then, so looking at it, um, the uh, O and P, um, they should uh, be put on as consent notes for lot two in terms of um, ongoing maintenance, irrigation, and so forth, um, ongoing maintenance, removal of, of um, wilding trees and wilding trees and the like. So should they still be under 18 as well? They're going two places. Is that my understanding? Uh, can you just give me a second, Commissioner? 18 isn't prior to 24C. No. No. Sorry, I was fine. Yeah, so the 18, um, where are we? In. Yeah, so so I think 18 M, uh, unless the landscape plan is changing again, um, 18 M should be um, uh, de deleted, and then yep. the the following but conditions that deal with. Deleted, but that's right. just the landscaping plan that doesn't actually require it to be planted. So where is it actually being but carried out? So if we go, so I just need to get into those conditions. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Right, thank you. Carried out at O at eighteen O. Oh, under the consent notice requirements, yeah. There is a condition link twenty that requires the. Um, a moment, I'm just trying to understand when it's intended to carry out the landscaping. Is that intended to be done prior to 224C or is your, is your, are you saying that should be pushed out? Uh, so so what, what the intention for landscaping is, so the new Leyland uh, Cypress Hedge on the southern boundary lot two, that's to be planted prior to title. So that is um, to be planted prior to title, which means um, it gets planted sooner. And then the remainder of the landscaping within lot two um, is to be planted um, by the future owner slash developer lot two um, within the first planting season following completion of the dwelling. Right. Within the first planting season? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so in effect, the only planting... Yeah. That's, yeah. G, that's 20G. Yeah, 20G. And the yes. removal of wild species, is, which is in 18P, is that to be done by the future owner or should that be done at the time of okay. prior to title? Um, if there's not removing, look, I'm pretty comfortable with um, having a condition that the uh, prior to title, the wild species are to, remo are to be removed. Okay, so, so 18P stays where it is. Now, 18O, that's requiring all landscaping to be done prior to title, and it to some extent contradicts 20G, which requires it to be done uh, prior to occupation of the unit. So what, so what you're saying to me, is, or to us, is that 18O needs to be amended to just include the Leyland hedge. Is that right? That's right, yes. Yeah. So, so basically, the, the Leyland is before title. Right, okay. And the installation of irrigation. So does the Leyland Hedge need irrigation? Uh, that's probably a question from maybe... Um, that Mr. Right. Stephen, but that it's depends in, on what the Leyland Hedge needs. Uh, so, sorry, I didn't quite get that. That depends on what the Leyland Hedge needs, whether or not we need that condition amended. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, look I'm not sure whether that type of hedge needs irrigation. Um, if it does, then... That would need to be included. Okay. Okay. Understood.
Okay, I have no further questions for you, Mr. Freeman. Thank you. Just one moment, I'll just confer with Commissioner Nick. Right, if, if that concludes your case, Ms. Hockley, I think we're ready to move on to the submitter. Yes, it does. Thank you, Commissioners. I'll just indicate uh, quickly now so that you can give it some consideration over the course of the hearing um, that it might be beneficial for me to provide some written closings on some of the matters discussed, um, in particular the potential changes to or further changes to LCU 11 and um, just to clarify these points on the conditions in writing. Thank you. Uh, Mr Eaton, that brings us to you, I believe. We can see you. I think you might be muted. I think we might be muted. Are we? No, we're not. Mr Eaton, we can't hear you. He's not muted. Uh, okay. Well, I can't can you, can anybody hear him? Turn here. It should be go. I'll just turn it up a little bit. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank That's you. Okay. Well, good afternoon. My name is Bill Eaton, and I am a director of Wakatibu Equities Limited, which owns the 350 acres to the east of the applicant's land. It's been described today very, in various ways to the west and east, but I will just confirm it is to the east. Uh, for clarity, <clears throat> I don't agree with the WBRAZ zoning or the 80 hectare minimum lot size for LCU 11. <clears throat> I have submitted and appealed with limited success to date. There are still some appeals going on. I'm somewhat surprised that if the applicants wanted to subdivide further that they did not submit an appeal also regarding the zoning. However, the reality at present is that WBRAZ um, as a minimum lot size of 80 hectares. QLDC has emphasized to Wakatibu Equities Limited that it is critically important that the lands from WEL's most eastern boundary through to the lands located on Lower Shotover Road be in the same zoning category with a minimum lot size of 80 hectares. As I noted, that seems ludicrous to me, but that is the reality. So looking at and listening to all the expert opinions and input, um, one can find agreement with all of the input from the point of view of the persons providing the input. The salient issue though, in this matter is does the subdivision meet the 80 hectare minimum? Since it does not, it fails to comply with the proposed district plan and therefore one would expect it should be turned down. Wakatibu Equities Limited is not particularly troubled by the subdivision per se, but does want to ensure equitable application of zoning and resource consents. WEL has been told that any further subdivision must comply with the PDP zoning and thus that must also apply to adjacent lands with the same zoning. Said another way, if the subdivision is approved, then Wakatibu Equities Limited would expect that if it applied for a resource consent for one or two 1.2 hectare sites just on the other side of the fence from the proposed subdivision, specifically lot two of that subdivision, that those sites would also be approved since the elevations are the same, the views are the same, the landscape mitigation could be applied in exactly the same manner and be fully consistent with the applicant's expert reports. 
The decision made in this case will certainly be used to support any subsequent applications for resource consent. And while I don't agree with a statement made by applicant's attorney, that I don't disagree with that statement that um, commissioners cannot necessarily consider uh, any future subdivision in the current decision since they don't know what that subdivision would look like. Uh, I would suggest that clearly a precedent will be set and this will be an important precedent as regards you know any subsequent resource consents not only Wakatipu Equities Limited but ones throughout the Wakatipu Basin. Wakatipu Equities Limited does not agree with Scott Freeman's rather sweeping assessment that there will be no loss of privacy from adjoining landowners. It very much depends on where you are on the adjoining property, whether it's properties, Wakatipu Equities properties to the east or other properties to the west. In regards to Steve Skelton's input, Wakatipu Equities Limited would comment that while Steve advises correctly that the closest building platform is 470 meters away, he's also aware from his own work and as stated in his evidence this morning, there are sites on Wakatipu Equity lands with potential development locations much closer than 470 meters away. Thus the same comment applies the loss of privacy depends somewhat on where you are on the property. As regards water, I've emphasized this and QLDC engineers have assessed that the water supply is adequate. Um, Wakatipu Equities believes that statement is true if the current board that supplies the applicant's residence on Speargrass Flat Road can also supply lot one and the proposed lot two. If that not, is not true, however, then the water supply is unknown and untested because lot one is now relying on the border on Wakatipu Equities lands. It has failed in the recent past. And if and when it does fail again, Wakatipu Equities will not allow, nor is it obligated to allow the applicant to put another bore on its property and none will be allowed. <clears throat> the applicants have advised that work is underway to tidy up trees and remove welding trees on our mutual boundary, which Walker to Equities appreciate, appreciates as it will help with dealing with welding seedlings and so on. I neglected to put in my summary, but in the commission, if the commissioners decide to approve the subdivision, Walker Tipu Equities Limited agrees with and supports the proposed conditions in Appendix 7 to QLDC's report as regards suggested conditions for the subdivision. <clears throat> so in closing, I don't envy the Commission's task in regards to this application. The current status in regards to the 80 hectare lot minimum is not as clear, at least to me, and I think to others, as stated by the applicant experts. I am somewhat conflicted in terms of my desire to protect openness and the rural amenity zone that we have and the rural environment that we have. It's, um, you know, I, I believe in, in terms of that protection, the application should be declined because it doesn't comply with the proposed district plan. But it's somewhat in my interest for the application to be approved as regards future plans on my own site. While it may be true that future subdivisions cannot be considered against this application, the decision will set an important precedent to all resource consents that follow. Thank you very much for the opportunity to comment. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Eaton. I'm, I, I'm glad you pointed out that you were conflicted because I was hearing that quite clearly. Um, I guess what I would like to understand from you is you have said that your um, site, and we haven't undertaken a site visit yet, so is of a similar elevation. Um, I can't remember the exact words that you use, but it's essentially very similar to this site. 
Are there any differences? Not really. It's right on the other side of the fence. The elevation's the same. Um, uh, now, and it's the rolling topography is the same. Uh, you know, in in you know discussions with uh, QLDCs, um, I don't know land or not the, the Brenda Gilbert, the expert that they have put forward to you know describe this LCU eleven uh, uh, aspects. She she claims that you can see. Uh, see those sites from various locations around the basin. We don't think that from our own research that that is in fact uh, possible. And Steve Kelton, at Skelton has put together a number of topographies and so on that show that it's not true. But if her view is that it's true, then the same thing would apply to lot two in this subdivision. Um, but in, you know, to be more precise about right, answering, you're saying, you're saying that lights from your site would be visible in the wider basin. Is that what you're saying? Yes. I think the, the views from the wider basin of lot two, and if I put in a 1.2 acre resource consent for just on the other side of the fence line, would be exactly the same. The topography would be exactly the same. Uh, the views from public and private places would be exactly the same, and the landscaping to mitigate anything would be exactly the same. Right. Okay. I just to make sure I've orientated myself correctly. You mentioned before you're on the eastern side of the applicant's proposed lot two. Is that right? Yes, I am on the eastern That's side. Your property is out of interest. Sorry. How big is the pro your property or well, the, um, the the organization's property? And what size is it? What total land area do you have? I have 350 acres to the east. Oh, 350 acres. That's uh, 350 acres or hectares. Acres. 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 Well, yeah. So that extends quite a long way, sort of in the direct Arrowtown direction. So it's a uh, yes, it uh, extends. Quite a long way along Spear Grass Flat Road. Okay, now yeah, see what you mean. Okay, okay. No, thank you for that. Um, you, you obviously understand that any decision we make, um, I mean, you've clearly said you'll, you'll potentially rely on any support of the subdivision on your property, but you realise that we can't make any decisions about your property. I, I understand fully, but I just, um, you know, the commissioners have to take their decisions based on, you know, the commissioner's guidelines and, you know, the law and so on. Uh, but I just think that it's, naive to think that whatever decision you take won't be relied on by others for future actions and so technically you can't be you can't weigh that into this decision but you can be aware of it. Yeah, no, that's that's actually helpful. Sorry, I one other question. Your um, mention was made before that your um, Hearing from Mr. Skelton about having your properties. I understand it. Is it have it moved out of LCU eleven into LCU eight? Was it that what you were property is uh, a long uh, Speargrass flat, flat road um, below the escarpment or in LCU eight, but from the top of the escarpment sloping downwards, it's all in LCU eleven. From a practical standpoint, because the escarpment is a very significant landscape of, you, you would know the term, landscape of significance, there's no probably practical development going on in Wakatipu Equity lands in LCU 8. It will all be in LCU 11. And, the, you know, we have six approved building sites already, and they're all in LCU 11. No, that's no, right. no, thank, thank you, you Mr. Eaton. It's very helpful. Um, right, we will now um, adjourn for lunch. Three quarters.
three quarters of an hour. Three quarters of an hour, so we will be back at 1.30 to continue the hearing, and I understand we will then be moving on to the council. Thank you.
Right, if everybody is back, then we will um, resume. Um, do we have council officers? It would appear not. We will wait till the council officers reappear. I'm sorry if we're here. We do have council officers. Wonderful. Um, so I'm not sure which order you wish to um, proceed in. Mr Hearn, um, Mr Denny first or yourself first? Um, yes, Mr Denny first and then Mr Newman, if he's still online. I actually can't see if he's online. Oh, oh, we, I haven't seen Mr Fromola, but we could, um, we could hear from Mr Fromola first if you wish, if he's here. We will hear from Mr. Denny first and then Mr. Yeah. Yeah. It is showing that he's online, but I don't know. Oh, he's not online. Okay. Right. Well, I'll have yeah, to start. Yeah. <laughs> I'll start. Um, I'll just go over my notes from this morning and then um, answer any questions you may have. Um, just one of the key things I've sort of noted is that this application is reliant on the surrounding open pastoral land around it, which maintains some of that character and the existing sort of woodland character of the actual site, neighbouring sites. There's a, a request for uh, to change some of the conditions regarding planting and timing of planting. Um, I would be supportive of planting that's not done prior to issuing the title. I think you would it's be or you would be, sorry? I uh, wouldn't be, yeah. Um, the planning needs to be done prior to issuing the title to get that established structure underway <coughs> and to ensure that any new um, owner of the land, the expectations are quite clear that that planning is there as part of the structural context rather than be done later. Uh, just on the um, changes to the landscape character unit descriptions, which I've just come aware of this morning, um, the key thing for me is that there's now wording in there about, in terms of landscape character, the uh, mature vegetation, which is quite key. It's quite a key part of those applications. It's constantly referred to in the uh, landscape report and my report as well. It's, it's, it's a key part of not just the character, but also the mitigating context of development. And that's been reiterated in that change of the landscape character description as well. Um, just to note, the landscape plan that's been submitted doesn't have any existing vegetation on it. It's planting a lot of stuff there that will eventually give some structure and maturity to the landscape, but that will take quite some time. And what I'd like to do is recommend a condition that there is additional mature trees on lot one that are identified to ensure that some of that will maintain that character of the site and its mitigated context as well. And mature trees on proposed lot one are protected, yes. certain mature trees. Right, and, and that is because that will be um, in line with, I'm just looking the, uh, the environmental characteristics of the LCU as they've been updated to include the well, your vegetation yes. features. Is that mine? Okay. Yes, well, it's, it's, it's an important part of this application and it's, a, and it's been identified in that updated. Uh, uh, landscape description. So in my mind, it should form part of the application as well. That there are some of those mature trees which define the site uh, to be identified to be retained. Uh, the original landscape plan for the large dwelling uh, that platform has quite a few trees on there, but none of that is carried through to this application. I think it's relevant. <laughs> Their microphone. I'm not sure. Sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah, sorry, somebody, I can hear lots of giggling. Right, that's oh. better. Um, so, you're saying the original landscape plan, which is associated with the approved building platform on lot one. Yeah, RMO 60, whatever yeah. it is. 
which is required to be carried out presumably at the time of a dwelling being constructed, I assume? Yes. Um, that doesn't include any of the existing landscaping? Uh, the original consent does include some existing trees on it. And since that consent was done, it has, well, as far as I can tell, there's been additional planning being done. It's not related to the consent, which are close to the boundary of between lots one and two. I think that's of value to the site, both in terms of character and uh, visual context. I was just trying to look for the landscape plan, which was associated with consent. I'm sure it's here somewhere. No, I think it's in my report. I think it's a couple of copies in there. What about the text? Yes, I think I'll... Okay. Uh, there was a comment this morning about removal of wildland pea, uh, pine species. I think, is that, I'm not sure if that was part of the application or not, or that's just something that's happening off, offline, but if it is part of the application, some obvious uh, possible effects from that. I just want to make a note of that. Um, I disagree that the site is invisible. I think it is visible, but it's got a very low visibility, but it, you can pick it out from certain viewpoints, and I think that needs to be recognised. Um, there was discussion of Mr. Skelton's um, evidence about the viewpoint. Oh, God, I've got that road down. Um, is it the main road? Up on the hill there, there's a couple of switchbacks that look over towards the site. It's about 2Ks away. Uh, and it, it is visible from places like that and for most dwellings in that area. So it's not completely invisible. I mean, it has got low visibility of the platform, but the actual site, you can pick it out in the landscape. Uh, in terms of irrigation for the hedge, I would probably say yes to these pieces of irrigation for the hedge, just because it's a mitigation hedge and you want fast establishment. Um, the I will grow very fast, but I think water is a decent thing to do, um, especially when you get more frequent of price cars. I think that's about it for me, actually. But happy to answer any questions. Okay. Uh, well, uh, one question. Um, you probably heard during the course of the hearing um, discussion about the adjoining land extending to the east, a very large block, Mr. Eaton. Uh, yes. here. Um, do you consider that obviously we'll go out and sight and look, but do you consider there's any merit to the argument that there's a strong similarity between the kind of character that, that you find on lot four and the land that's on that adjoining property? Um, I don't think any site's identical, so you'd have to assess it on its, like they say, on, on its own merits. Um, the lot is kind of a large open, open pastoral lot, and there are big trees around it, much mainly around the subject property and around the drive to the eastern property. Um, so I wouldn't say it's identical, I think there are some differences there which would be taken into account as a future assessment as such. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mr. Denny, you are obviously here throughout the hearing. Ms. Hockley, Mr. Freeman, and Mr. Skelton set out in their um, submissions and evidence the areas of disagreement and agreement. Um, did you have any? Were you concerned about any of those statements which related to your evidence? No, it seems uh, pretty consistent, I think. I think the only areas of disagreements are probably the localised effects on the neighbours. Um, 
I guess the other slight disagreement would be me in terms of the reliance on the context of mature trees within the site versus the surrounding landscape, and having some assurance that that context will be retained, I guess. I think I got that in my report where I talk about potential effects being higher if that vegetation was removed. There's probably some slight disagreement there, and the, um, I guess, speculation of if those trees would remain or be removed in the future. So, John David lots of us. Okay. Um, and Mr. Freeman um, has asked for condition 18M to be removed because in his view, the landscape plan now submitted achieves that. Do you agree? No. Um, sorry, what was 18M again? The, the condition which requires the amendment of the landscape plan. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. Yeah, and I'll, I will add additional recommendation there for identifying further trees on lot one. Be my okay. uh, have the other matters been met? I believe so, yeah. So we could just, uh, uh, remove, sorry, I haven't got the condition now, but we could remove all the sub clauses and simply add identification of mature trees on proposed lot one. Yeah, we probably need a, well, yeah, we probably need to give some criteria for that, I guess, in terms of which trees, but. Uh, well, what criteria do you consider relevant? Well, it'd be only trees and sort of a, a, a sort of a rough thing on it. 50 metres offset from that boundary between lots one and two, that shared boundary on that downward slope area, and it'll exclude any wildlife species. So exclude wilding species, and what was the other thing you said? Sorry, I didn't hear. Uh, it's just mature trees with roughly 50 metres offset from that shared boundary between lots one and two. Up to 50 metres? Sorry? Up to 50 metres. Oh, <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> Well, I would say, well, I'll get you up there, Zach. Um, uh, yeah, I would say up to 50 metres. I don't think all the trees all the way down the slope of the plantation have to be identified. It doesn't need to be that thorough. It just needs to have some structure on that neighbouring lot in context of the site. of Mr. Skelton, and I'll say of you too, the rural character and visual amenity get very mixed up. Yes. Um, Mr. Skelton um, gave a helpful um, um, description of the rural character and um, he said it's basically the spatial pattern which determines it. And as soon as you get over one building per 1.5 hectare, you're in a rural character of some description. Um, and he then said the rural character in this area will essentially not change whether you put this extra lot and building platform in or you don't. Is that your view on the rural character here? Ooh, I don't think it's that precise in terms of quantifying it as such. Um, I mean, the, the, rural, the rural character of this unit in this area is, is built on the open pastoral lots. There's a, there's a mix of open and there's a mix of woodlands. Well, it's, it's largely uh, open pastoral, I guess you'd say, with mixed rural lifestyle and a few sort of larger lot blocks in there as well and some small blocks as well. So it's quite diverse, but because it's elevated, it's quite visible. 
but there are sections that are not, of course, because you've got some variation and undulation of landform and in terms of maturity of trees, which is reiterated in the landscape character description. So would this house actually make a difference to that character? How would this application? Would this extra lot, an extra building platform with a future built <coughs> actually make any difference to the, <coughs> to the character here? Yeah, well, it's difficult because the visual effects are so low, and so therefore there's an implication that there's going to be no landscape character effects. I kind of disagree to some degree because there's an intensity thing here. Um, you're getting a greater proportion of residential activity that comes with development, even though you may not see the buildings, there's all the stuff that comes with it, the vehicles, the, the noise, long hours, all the rest of it, plus there's all this where all the amenity planning that comes with it, the amenity land use of that lot. So it's no longer supporting, I guess you say, a traditional rural character, it's becoming more residential incrementally and slowly, and on a small scale, but it does have an effect, I think, that it will change your character over time. I think that's an issue we've been working with because um, it seems like it's almost like business as usual with the new planning regime as with the old one under the ODP. In other words, um, yeah. this is application. Can you see proposed house? No, you can't, so it's okay. Now that's an oversimplification, but it's not entirely oversimplified. And we're just wondering whether we need to look beyond just uh, visual amenity into landscape character, which is more than just whether you can see something or not. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do feel like we're going around in circles sometimes. Because um, there is a sort of almost an emphasis now to put smaller lots and residential development into woodland areas or topography and stuff like that, which makes sense because you can screen it visually, uh, visually, but to my mind, it becomes a saturation point where you can no longer absorb that. Um, because of the activity that comes with it, it no longer can support a real landscape as such. So it becomes artificial too in some regards as well. Um, it's, it's an age-old thing though, it's a, it's a cumulative death by a thousand cuts scenario where you're doing a very small scale of development, but collectively you'll ultimately have an effect on the raw character. It's unavoidable, I would have thought. So is this our thousandth and one cut, or is this somewhere back? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think in this instance, in terms of the general landscape character, it's probably not. In terms of how the neighbour perceives the landscape character, it probably is. Yes, I'm here. Oh, right. Um, now, we have obviously pre made it ready for uh, report. Do you have any comments you would like to make? Um, not anything further than what I've said in my report. Do you have Just one that that a result of Mr. Eaton. I don't know whether you heard him earlier, but he, he's a neighbour. a very, very large property, and he made a comment to the effect. Yep that um, the applicant um, has a bore which apparently is going to serve both lot one and lot two, but there may be a problem with the um, supply from that bore, in which case they'd be relying on a bore on Mr. Eaton's property. Uh, I couldn't quite understand that. Perhaps, I don't know if I was um, So, yeah, I don't understand it totally as well. From my understanding and my opinion, the existing um, residential unit on the lot um, will, the, the existing water supply will serve um, the building platform on lot one. 
um, and the uh, building platform on lot two will be served by a different bore that's located on one of the applicant's uh, properties or lots. Um, so it's the, the supply for lot one and two uh, comes from separate bores. Um, the applicant also provided a infrastructure feasibility report by Civilized, on which I based my assessment when I provided comment on the water supply. And the expert evidence provided by Civilized stated that the water supply is adequate for both lots. Additionally, um, if I just can add, I also recommended um, that the applicant obtain engineering approval um, for both the water supplies to lot, lot one and two prior to works commencing. So um, in that process, the um, supplies will be assessed um, in further detail. Okay, so essentially what you're telling us is at the moment you've been given evidence which suggests or gives you very good reason to understand that there will be sufficient water. There's another step in the process to double check that before yes. they actually need to yes. do anything. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Parola. No problem. No, 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 okay, short and sweet. Um, thank you. Mr. Huron. Um, I don't have too much to add other uh, on top of what I've already covered in my 42A report and the addendum that was circulated yesterday um, that you both received this morning. Um, I think that subject to the additional condition <coughs> that recommended by uh, Mr. Denny before, um, I still consider that the proposal meets the overarching purpose of the rural amenity zone. Um, and I, I consider that the proposal aligns with the intention of Objective 24.21, which seeks to maintain or enhance landscape character and rural, rural amenity values. Um, and is also consistent with the provisionally amended policy 24.211. Sorry, Danielle. Um, Sorry, Mr. Hearn, I'm not quite hearing every word and I'm missing the important do's or don'ts. Oh, right. Sorry. Um, Hopefully this is better. Do you want me to start again? <laughs> Please, sorry. Okay. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, I might just move a bit closer. So um, as I've already covered in the addendum that was circulated yesterday, um, I consider, oh, I am subject to the um, additional recommended conditions from Mr. Denny. Um, I still consider that the proposal meets the overarching purpose of the zone um, and aligns with the intention of Objective 2421, um, as well as the provisionally amended policy 24211. Um, although the final wording of this policy is yet to be determined, I think it does provide a clear indication of the policy direction and leans towards a more qualitative assessment. Uh, but given that the Environment Court has endorsed the four-tier framework in the rural amenities zone and has confirmed the 80 hectare lot size in low-rated areas, um, in my mind, this sets an expectation that an 80 hectare lot size would generally be maintained. Um, in the case of this proposal, because of the size and proximity of the approved building platform on lot one, I consider that the proposal represents an intensification of residential activities in a relatively small area that is not appropriate. Um, I therefore still do have concerns about cumulative and rural amenity effects. Um, despite the proposed building platform being quite visually well contained, um, as rural amenity relates to much more than just the visual perception of the landscape, as we've already touched on. Um, I'd also just like to add that if consent is granted, I think it would be appropriate to identify a curtilage area to the north of the proposed building platform um, in order to avoid the encroachment of residential activities south towards um, 324 Lower Shadow River Road. Um, I think that's it for me, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Sure. 
Um, Mr. Huna, the um, the legal advice provided by Mr. Lecky and Ms. Hockley on the existing uh, and whether or not that has been exercised, so whether or not the large house is uh, existing environment. Did did you have that? Peer reviewed by council's legal team, or was anything done with that? No, we actually didn't. Um, we just accepted their legal advice. Okay. So it's your view that that house can still be constructed under that consent? Yes, that's my understanding. and Mr. Freeman comment on the areas of agreement and disagreement between yourselves. Um, as I understand it, there is basically one, which is the cumulative effects on rural character in respect of the persons at two to four Speargrass. Yes, that's correct. Is that the only area of disagreement? Yes. You obviously are also um, familiar, at least from public views, of Mr. Eaton's site. In your view, are the two sites, or the, the, the area of Mr. Eaton's site that he keeps referring to as potentially similar to um, proposed lot two of the applicant's site, are they similar in your view, significantly similar? I wouldn't, just from what I've seen of that site, I wouldn't have thought they were similar because I couldn't see any vegetation, not that I was taking a lot of note of vegetation on that site, but I don't recall seeing um, vegetation and in this case I think the proposed building platform is quite contained because of the topography and the um, existing vegetation and I'm not sure if that's the same for the um, Mr. Eden's property. Okay. In your view, are there um, similar sites within the district? So I'm, I'm getting at the precedent effect and what kind of precedent this is going to set and whether this site, whether this consent is essentially replicable in other places throughout the district. Um, just from doing a review of the um, GIS maps and looking at the surrounding area, I wouldn't have thought so because I think it is quite well contained. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't think that it would set an unacceptable precedent. Yeah, because I think just following up on that question, um, I think the <laughs> sorry bearing in mind the neighbouring submitter is still a participant in the appeal proceedings. Um, he made their intentions very clear. He's the owner of an extremely large property by the standards of the Wong Siwi Basin. And he's basically, my understanding was he says he's also part of a Hamaki Terrace, which continues on to the neighbouring property. And I think um, uh, even Mr. Skelton conceded that, that, that the Hamaki Terrace continued on to um, the property to the east. And that with, by siting dwellings on that area and undertaking planting, you could equally have dwellings that could be not would, that would not be seen. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that is a good point. I mean, I, I'm not familiar with that site, so I don't know. Yeah, how feasible it would be um, for a subdivision of that site. Um, 
there's a further question we've talked before about um, you know, the 80 hectares being a standard that um, I think I understood so that standard that should, should be aimed for effectively. Um, just notice here, I was thinking of what, what, what the court said in paragraph 75 of its decision. They said, however, we do not accept council's further submission that QLDC's proposed revised policy 24211 would signal what level of development or subdivision is appropriate relative to identified landscape capacity. Rather, we would give a broad invitation to discretionary judgment with minimal landscape character outcome direction. That comment, rather, we would find it give a broad invitation to discretionary judgment with minimal landscape character. Now, suggest it's like a trigger below which you need to undertake, uh, need to um, exercise discretion rather than a level of density that can be. Um, so, um, what uh, paragraph are you referring to? The um, sound isn't very good and you just keep dipping out of it, so I'm struggling to follow you, unfortunately. Environment Court decision. Um, in the C58, it came out on 12th of April. Yes. On chapter 24, topics 25 and 30, paragraph 75. I'm sorry, what was your question about this one? Well, then, what that suggests to me is that the 80 hectares is not a, a standard or, or, or level of density that is expected to be met. Um, rather, it's, it's acting as a trigger point below which, and I think the words under sub clause B below, um, would give a full binary direction either to avoid new residential development or subdivision or residential activity outside the precinct. Then the critical words are, or to enable it, subject to soft directions in its clauses A and B. That seems to be almost a return to the good old days of the ODP. Sorry, I'm just <laughs> getting my hand around this. Yeah, it is quite difficult, but, um, but it's... That's originally um, formulated. The 80 hectares was sort of a, sta a density standard to be achieved. And what the court seems to be doing there is saying, yes, up to a point, but enable it subject to soft directions and clauses A and B. So you just make a good case. And it could be 80 hectares, could be eight, could be one, could be two. Yes. Well, I think given the um, provisional wording of policy 24211, I think it seems like the direction it's going in, it seems to be relying more on landscape outcomes. Um, yeah. As I said, more a more qualitative assessment rather than yeah, relying on that 80 hectare as a bottom line. Yeah, that's as I understand it. Yeah, I just thought I'd explore that a bit. 
because um, obviously everyone's been caught on the hop by this. I don't know how long you've even had to look at this decision. Uh, we didn't start reading it until this morning. So it's um, difficult to sort of get, get one's head around very quickly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, right, I don't think I have any further questions for Mr. Hewitt, do you? No, I don't. No, I don't think I do. Um, maybe just um, have a look at the conditions with you, Mr. Hurner. So we've got, um, where have they gone? Here they are. So we have got uh, a request from Freeman that um, planting be undertaken uh, on lot two, with the exception of the Leyland Hedge subsequent to title, so at the time of a future dwelling development. Mr. Denny is opposing that. What's your view? Um, I would agree with Mr. Denny. I think it would be more appropriate to um, require it before um, titles are issued. For any particular reason? I think because um, it is quite reliant on the, the tree context um, and because it is quite well contained and just um, adding to that, I guess, I think it is quite important to get the, the planting established before um, titles are issued. Okay. Um, I have no further questions. No, further no, no further questions. Thank you very much. Um, that must conclude the council's case, I assume. And it brings us back to you, yes. Ms. Hopkins. Yes, yes. Good, thank you. Um, Ms. Hockley, I understand you would like to give your submissions or your um, right to reply in writing. Do you want to make any uh, verbal comments? Uh, not at this stage, Commissioner, following what, what's been traversed, I do still think it's um, be most appropriate to give my closing in writing. And in particular, I, I do have a question about whether it would be of assistance to you for us to provide some further evidence about um, the landscape character of the Eaton site to, to the east. Hold that thought for a moment, we'll just have a sidebar. Right, we, we've just conferred on that. Um, as you're aware, we've still got to undertake our site visit, which we will do tomorrow afternoon. Yeah. Um, we can see that there may be some value in additional evidence, but until we have undertaken our site visit, we are not sure. And we are also conscious that any extra evidence will need to um, allow other parties the same rights. So, we are going to make that decision after our site visit. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, in that case, it may be best to um, reserve the number of days required for the closing um, until you've made that decision, uh, just yes. given it may require some more time if evidence is required. Uh, if I may suggest, uh, if you do decide the evidence is needed uh, that we may ask for 15 working days to provide the closing. Appreciate that's a bit longer than usual. Well, what about how would the parties get to respond? Would you provide your evidence and your closing at the same time or would you provide your evidence and then we'd wait for the parties to provide their evidence and then you'd reply, provide your reply? Uh, Yes, no, that's that's a good question. Uh, when I first thought about this, I had conceived that our 
evidence on the site to the east would be in the form of reply to Mr Eaton and therefore wouldn't require further comment from other parties, but you've noted a preference that perhaps they do have a chance to respond. Uh, on that basis, perhaps some more appropriate would be 10 working days for our evidence, um, followed by w whichever comments you consider appropriate from other parties, and then another five working days for our closings. Yeah, so I appreciate it's a bit more bureaucratic and delayed, but it's probably in need of fairness to the parties. Uh, that's probably the best course of action. I mean, yeah. I imagine you need to be talking to Mr. Skelton. Mr. Skelton would probably need to do some form of assessment rather than simply express a view. Yes. Uh, if that's the case, then you get into a situation where you need um, other parties to have the opportunity to comment. Um, on a much more mundane topic, we're looking at doing the site visit at two o'clock tomorrow. Tomorrow is a Friday. Yes, yeah. um, so I take it the property will be open for us to go into? Yes, I expect that won't be an issue. I'll just confirm that with the applicant and I will send a note through Trish for you. Yeah, thank excellent, you. thank you. Um, okay. I don't think we have any other issues, do we? Oh, no, apart from obviously at some stage there would need to be uh, coordination with yourselves and the council on the final wording of conditions. Yes, yes, if you make sure, yeah, so that was um, in your reply, if you can make sure it has a track changes version of conditions with any comments on disagreement. Um, and if the only other thing I'd noted for your reply is to comment on the scope of those appeals on LCU 11. Um, yes. just Confirm, uh, Mr. Skelton obviously gave us quite a good overview, but just confirm that that's um, where it sits. Um, I didn't make any other notes for your reply, so that's what I'm I'm expecting at least. All right, thank you. Um, but that's clear. So we will provide a confirmation about the site visit for tomorrow, and then we'll await your directions. Yes. Yes, which we will anticipate issuing on Friday afternoon after the site visit, or potentially they'll come through your Monday morning, just depending on Ms. Anderson's availability, but hopefully very soon. All right. Thank you, Commissioners. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody, for your attendance and um, your helpful evidence. Um, and we will issue our minute in due course. Cool. cool. Right. So okay. one thing, Commissioners, I'll just hear back from the, the applicant, and 2 o'clock tomorrow is fine to visit the site. Excellent. Right. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Yes. Bye.